Hi, this is Tamara. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, Tamara. Hi, thanks, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, AP, council staff, members of the public. This morning, we're going to be taking up D2 MRA adjustments. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that the minutes for uh, the rationale for um, C2 salmon bycatch is, is going on. If we could have those approved in the next like 10, 15 minutes, it would be, it's pretty important because we're going to be delivering the report on that very soon. Um, with that, also a reminder to everyone that it is Nicole's birthday, I'm told. Not going to say I'm sorry for that. Happy birthday, and thanks for the wonderful work you do. Uh, I think you and I have fundamental differences in the way that we think. <laughs> um, with that, I think we'll take our staff presentations on, on D2. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, members of the AP and chair. Uh, Nicole Watson, council staff. Just to clarify, it is not my birthday. It is the other Nicole's birthday. <laughs> I am joined today by Krista Milani with NIMPS. Uh, in October 2023, the council passed a motion to support NIMS in their presentation of a discussion paper to inform potential adjustments to the maximum retainable amount of species closed to directed fishing while the vessel operator is engaged in fishing for species or species groups that are open to directed fishing. The intent of this discussion paper was to provide the council with information about how the MRA regulations could be modified to reflect current practices, to give an overview of industry proposed regulatory changes, and to provide possible regulatory changes that could be assessed. After reviewing the discussion paper and listening to public testimony, the Council's task is to determine whether to move forward by developing a purpose and need statement or alternatives for analysis regarding MRAs. And with that, I will turn it over to Krista. Good morning, um, members of the AP, Mr. Chair. My name is Krista Milani. I work for the National Marine Fisheries Service Sustainable Fisheries Division, and I'm part of the in-season management team. And this presentation is on D2, maximum retainable amounts. This first slide is just to give you a roadmap of how the presentation is going to be laid out, as well as the way that the discussion paper is laid out. So there's some information on some background for MRAs. Then there's a section on some proposed agency changes then some possible proposed industry changes, and then the last couple of sections are some other additional considerations regarding MRAs. So what is an MRA? MRA stands for maximum retainable amount, and it's the maximum round weight of a species that's closed to directed fishing that may be retained on board a vessel. So otherwise known as incidental catch. Um, MRAs are determined by percentages that are set in regulation and use species that are open to directed fishing as the basis species. I want to stress that MRAs only um, regulate ground fish species and species that are regulated under the PSC regulations, such as halibut, salmon, herring, and um, crab are not um, subject to MRAs. Those are regulated through PSC. The purpose of MRAs is to slow the harvest rate of incidental catch species, especially when those incidental catch species tax are low. So it ensures that we're not going over those tax. And it also is to allow some retention of species that are close to directed fishing when those species have some sort of economic value. 
There are some species that have some mandatory retention requirements, and those include species that are regulated under the Improved Retention, Improved Utilization Program, which we'll talk about later. And there's some other species that have some full retention requirements, such as rockfish for non-CVQ or non-trawl CVs, and um, species uh, that are harvested during the electronic monitoring trawl program. This slide is the. Um, oh. I'm sorry. Thank you. If we could pause, uh, Lauren has a question. Go ahead, Lauren. Sorry, through the chair. Thank you for the presentation so far. Um, I, I appreciate you bringing out the definitions, and um, I wish I could have wrapped my brain around this starting over again. I think we're all pretty at the end of our wire here. Um, so I just I have a question, something that I've been grappling with as I'm thinking about this. And so there's there's a difference in regulation between incidental catch and bycatch, and that basically that that defining factor is the PSC designation. Yeah, so you you can refer to anything as bycatch. So even a ground fish species, you could refer to as bycatch. But PSC is usually regulated under limits. So there's not PSC species, they're not legal to retain at all. They're they're prohibited species. And so we tend to call those bycatch more often than incidental catch. Does that answer the, your question? Yeah, but I guess I, I I have I think in my brain I keep thinking incidental catch bycatch is basically the same thing, but it's the designation in regulation kind of is that that PSC term attached to it. I'm just trying to figure out where that that line is because I, an incidental catch kind of is a bycatch, right? right. <laughs> Through the chair, I don't I don't know that the semantics really matter that much in regulation versus you know for incidental catch versus bycatch. I guess in relation to MSA. In relation to the MSA. Um, National Standard 9 specifically. Yeah, if it's if it's retained, it, well, sorry, I'm listening to Julie. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not sure on the answer to your question regarding the MSA. Thank you. Do we have any other questions while we're paused? Please continue. Hi. I'm sorry. Oh, just kidding. Annika, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks, Krista. I guess when I'm thinking about incidental catch, I'm thinking about catch that is um, catch that is unavoidable. So it, it's it's catch that is brought up kind of when directed fishing for something else. And so the purpose of the MRA regulations is to allow for some of that incidental catch to be kept. Whereas when I think of bycatch, I think of it as PSC species or something that is meant to be avoided to the extent practicable by groundfish fisheries. Is that kind of a better explanation of the difference? Uh, through the chair, Annika, um, Nicole has helped me out here. And it, um, under the MSA, bycatch is defined as fish that are harvested in a fishery that are not sold or kept for personal use and include both economic and regulatory discards. So I guess that means under the MSA, bycatch would be for species that are not kept for personal use. So Annika, you're correct. Species that are incidental catch species are species that you can retain and um, that are actually kept. Okay, thank you. I think yeah. that's helpful. Lauren did that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not trying to create contention. I'm just trying to like, in my mind, just separate the two and just like make sure I'm on the right train as I walk into this presentation. So thank you for the clarification as we move forward. Uh, through the chair. No problem, Lauren. Sorry that, that I didn't know the answer to that. Thanks, Nicole, for the save there. All right, moving forward. All right, so this definition, uh, this uh, slide shows the definition of a fishing trip um, as it's defined in regulation and as it pertains to uh, the calculations of MRAs. So it's really important that everyone understands what the definition of a fishing trip as it pertains to MRAs, and the definition of a fishing trip is not offload to offload. For the purposes of MRAs, the definition of a fishing trip for catcher processors and motherships has five different triggers, and for catcher vessels, there's one trigger. For catcher processors and motherships, the first trigger is the effective date of a notification prohibited directed fishing in the same area. So that would be, for example, you're fishing in an area that's open to directed fishing for Pacific cod, 
And then NIMS puts out a notice saying that fishing, uh, fishing for Pacific cod is now closed. So that puts a CPR mothership in a new fishing trip. The second trigger is the offload or transfer of all fish. I think that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, the third trigger is if the vessel enters or leaves an area with a different fishing prohibition. So that would be like if you're, uh, you're fishing in an area that's open to Pacific Cod and then you move to an area that's closed to Pacific Cod, you'd be in a new trip. The fourth trigger is when the, ve the vessel starts to fish with a different type of authorized gear. So if you're fishing with hook and line gear and then you start fishing for pot gear, that is a different fishing trip. And the last trigger is the end of a weekly reporting period. A weekly reporting period runs Sunday through Saturday. So every Sunday, a CP and mothership is in a new fishing trip um, for purposes of calculating the MRAs. A catcher vessel has one fishing trip trigger, and that's the time they begin harvesting the ground fish until all of the fish on board has been transferred off of the vessel. So usually catcher vessels are offloading their entire catch um, when they come into a port or to a tender, but sometimes those vessels um, still have fish on board and do a partial offload and they go back out fishing with fish still on board and that does not end a fishing trip for the purposes of a catcher vessel. Um, instead, the trip is ended once their holds are empty. So again, um, an offload does not mean, or a, a fishing trip does not mean offload to offload. And so throughout this presentation, when I'm referring to a fishing trip, this is the definition that I'm um, referring to. All right. Monica. Thanks, Krista. So is it fair to say that the regulatory definition of fishing trip is kind of a more complex for catcher processors and mother? ships is a more complex uh, multi-component definition and isn't necessarily the common English language understanding of what you and the public might think of as a fishing trip. Is that accurate? Yes, through the chair. Yeah, the definition of a fishing trip, especially for catcher processors and motherships is, is fairly complex. And there's a lot of different triggers that would create a new fishing trip for the purposes of MRAs. So it's not usually how we think about um, a fishing trip. And I think in most people's heads, we're thinking about offload to offload, which is simply not the case for CPs and motherships. Okay, I'm gonna go through some agency recommended revisions to MRAs. Um, NIMS has identified regulations regarding MRAs and improved retention, improved utilization or IRIU that need some modifying. And there's a couple of different reasons that we believe they need modifying. Um, the first is for clarity. So some of the regulations are a little bit unclear exactly how those calculations and how MRA should be applied to certain vessels. So we'd like to um, make some changes there. Um, the second is to correctly reflect past actions that the council has taken um, and that have occurred in the MSA. And the last is to correct some citations that were not right um, in the regulations. I wanna stress that none of the modifications that the agency is recommending to revise um, would change the way that MRAs are currently operating. So if all of these were implemented, the MRAs, uh, the way the industry is calculating their MRAs would remain exactly the same. There are three uh, parts to the MRA regulations that we believe need revisions. One is the definition of a fishing trip, which you just saw on the last slide. Uh, the second part is the calculation of MRAs, um, and that would be like, how do you use the percent tables? Um, what is included as a basis species? And the third uh, part is the application of MRAs, and that's how MRAs would be applied to different vessel sectors. So we're just gonna jump right into the first one. Um, uh, NIMS has identified one issue under the definition of a fishing trip that we believe could use some clarity and that involves catcher vessels delivering unsorted cod ends to motherships. Motherships have the same fishing trip definition as catcher processors, but it's unclear exactly how that fishing trip definition should apply to a mothership because motherships are not actively fishing, and instead those vessels are receiving unsorted cod ends from catcher vessels, and the mothership is doing all the sorting and discarding of that catch. So in practice, it's the mothership that's responsible for those MRA calculations. 
Likewise, for the definition of a catcher vessel for a fishing trip, it doesn't exclude catcher vessels that are delivering unsorted cottons. But catcher vessels that are delivering unsorted cottons do not have access to that catch, so that means they're unable to sort and discard their catch. If they're unable to discard their catch, then they're unable to comply with the MRA regulations. And as I stated before, it's actually in practice the motherships that are responsible for those MRAs. So we would like to um, change the definition of a fishing trip to reflect, um, to reflect that. Moving on to the calculation section, NIMS has identified three issues. The first um, is involving the management program. And so management program includes things like Amendment 80, IFQ, open access. Um, often vessels are participating in multiple management programs at the same time. And currently vessels are calculating their MRAs based on each management program separately. And that's because different management programs have different fishing prohibitions. So what might be open for directed fishing for one management program might be closed to directed fishing in another management program. So we'd like to add, la add language in the calculation section, making it clear that MRA should be calculated by each management program separately. Under uh, the second issue is when CPs are also acting as motherships. The definition of a fishing trip for CPs and motherships is the same, and often they're doing both activities at the same time within a fishing trip and within the same management program. Currently, MRAs are being calculated based on CP and mothership activity combined, and we would like to add some language uh, making it clear that that is how that should be done. The third issue is involving CDQ. Current regulations state that only CDQ allocated species can be used as a basis species when calculating MRAs. This is mostly an issue when CDQ is harvesting Amendment 80 species. Under the um, uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act, um, CDQ cannot be treated more restrictively than other um, fishery cooperative programs that are fishing for the same species. Um, as a result, um, CDQ vessels should be able to use any open species to Amendment 80 as a basis species when calculating their MRAs, and we would like to add some um, language clarifying that in regulation. Annika. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Krista. I just want to make sure that I understand this one. So, uh, Am I correct? So a species like Alaska place, Alaska place is open to directed fishing for a memonity typically in the beginning of the year, um, but isn't a CDQ allocated species. So is the idea basically to let CDQ kind of uh, use Alaska place as a basis species to sort of bring them up to the same level? Uh, through the chair, yes, that's correct, Annika. Um, Alaska Place and Kamchatka flounder are not CDQ allocated species, but are species that Amendment 80 that are open directed fishing for Amendment 80, and Amendment 80 vessels can use those as a basis species when they're fishing under the Amendment 80 program. And CDQ vessels are doing the same thing because of the Magnuson Stevens language, um, but we'd like to just make that clear in regulation. Lauren. Thank you. And just to clarify too, when you say a CDQ vessel, is this a vessel that is harvesting CDQ or a vessel owned by a CDQ? If you could just clarify what that means. Sure. Through the chair. Um, yes. A vessel that is harvesting CDQ. So when they're operating in the CDQ management program. Thank you. Uh, I th think we can continue. Okay. Um, the third section is for the application of MRAs, and again, NIMS has identified three issues. The first issue, again, is going back to those CVs delivering unsorted cottons to motherships. I'm not going to explain uh, that issue again, but we would like to add some language in the application section of MRAs, clarifying how those MRAs are applied to motherships. The second issue involves Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Pollock and Bering Sea Aka Mackerel. Um, those MRAs are calculated at the time of offload, except if you're an AFA vessel. Um, the regulatory citation in this part of the regulations is incorrect and points to the wrong um, place for AFA vessels. We'd like to correct that. 
Um, we'd also like to add a citation um, for the AFA replacement vessels, which is not um, currently there in regulation. The third issue is about AFA vessels um, being used to fish Amendment 80 species in the CDQ program. As I just talked about, um, CDQ cannot be treated more restrictively than um, other Amendment 80 vessels. And so as a result, CDQ vessels should be able to calculate Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Pollock and Bering Sea Aka mackerel MRAs at the time of offload. Um, and that's what they're currently doing. And that's even if they're using an AFA vessel. And so we would like to change the language um, to reflect that. All right. So improved retention, improved utilization program, otherwise known as IRIU, um, is pretty intertwined with MRAs. So we thought this was probably a good time to also address some IRIU issues. Um, if you're not familiar with the improved retention, improved utilization program, um, it's a program that regulates some specific species and it's designed to help reduce regulatory discards of those species and also to improve the utilization of those species when they are retained. The first issue um, that we've identified is that there is a conflict between the way the MRA regulations are written and the way the IRIU regulations are written. Um, this mostly just applies right now to catcher vessels, although there is a CP and mothership issue that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but as far as this issue, it's mostly it's just catcher vessels. And that's because there's a regulation that states that the, the most restrictive area for MRAs that a catcher vessel fishes in is the MRA that's applicable for the entire fishing trip. So if a vessel goes into an area that's closed to Pacific cod and they're fishing stable fish, they can only keep up to the MRA levels of Pacific cod. If they move to an area that's open to Pacific cod during the same fishing trip, um, then they can also only keep up to MRA levels of Pacific cod because they've already fished in an area with a low, a lower MRA. This is, an, this is a conflict with IRIU. Under the IRIU program, when you're in the area that is closed to Pacific cod, you can keep up to, you have to keep up to the MRA. If you're fishing in an area that's open to Pacific cod, you have to retain all of your Pacific cod and you're not allowed to discard any. So a catcher vessel would be in violation of the IRIU regulations if they discarded their Pacific cod, but they would be in violation of the MRA regulations if they um, went over the MRA amount. Um, currently, we do tell vessels that the MRAs take precedence over the IRIU, and we'd like to um, make that clear in regulation um, whether the MRA or the IRIU takes precedence. Thank you through the chair. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Krista, for the presentation. Like we've all been saying our brains are fried. Um, I just wanted to clarify that when we say that the MRA takes precedence over the IRIU, um, is that going to be also for like the Gulf of Iraq, Gulf of Alaska rockfish program MRA table as well? which I think it should. I just am asking if it would be clarified in regulation because we had that question come up last year and it took like three different phone calls to figure out. So um, through the chair, yes. Yeah, it would refer to any of that. Any Anything that's in the IRIU regs, any species that's in the IRIU regs, we would make clear that the MRA takes precedent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please continue. All right. The second issue involves um, IRU for Amendment 80. Um, currently, the regulations state that all groundfish FMP species are IRIU species for Amendment 80. Um, but this seems to be a holdover from back in the day when groundfish retention standards were in place, and those regulations have since been removed. Currently, there is a 15% utilization standard for all retained FMP groundfish for Amendment 80 and Amendment 80 is required to sm submit annual reports to NIMPS and the council that includes information on um, groundfish retention. And I believe that the council receives those reports during this meeting. Um, Amendment 80 is now working under retention compliance standards, which is an initiative, which is a um, cooperative initiative to help reduce um, discards within their cooperatives. And also it, that initiative tries to keep the uh, retention rates as close as possible as, the, as to the old groundfish retention standards that used to be in place. 
Um, so we'd like to clarify that the IRIU regulations is meant to only apply to the 15% utilization standard when ground fish is retained and not to the full retention of all FMP ground fish. And I'll pause for a moment. That's the end of the industry, or that's the end of the agency um, uh, proposed modifications. Thank you, Patty. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So, what is a fifteen percent utilization standard exactly? Through the chair, that's an, a good question. So the 15% utilization standard means they have to make a product out of at least 15% of the species that they've retained. So, and that's by round weight. Follow up. 15% okay. of the MRA species or 15% of all species? Through the chair, it's fifteen percent of the I of an IRIU species. What, which for I guess for Amendment eighty, that includes all ground fish FMP species. Yeah. Any other questions, Paul? Sorry to to clarify. Do you mean fifteen percent of each individual fish, or are you talking about sort of more holistically for for a period of time? Um, through the chair, it's uh, fifteen percent of the round total round weight of the species that they have on board that they retained. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead and continue, please. Okay, now we're going to move into some industry proposed regulatory revisions, um, and these would change the way that MRAs are are being calculated currently. So in October, the council received a comment letter from industry with um, some proposed regulatory revisions into the way that MRAs work. Um, we don't have alternatives yet, so we're gonna call these revision one and revision two. So uh, revision one would be to revise the fishing trip definition for CPs and motherships from five triggers to two. Um, and then there was an option to add some additional species um, to the offload uh, MRA calculation. The second revision or revision two would again to be re revise the fishing trips from five triggers to two, and it would include all MRA species. Um, all species would be applied at the time of offload for the MRA calculations. And I'm gonna talk about each of these in more detail in a few minutes, but as we go along, you might wanna consider if you wanted to move forward with these proposed revisions, whether or not they should apply to all vessel sectors and management programs or to just some vessel sectors and management programs. All right, there's um, a couple of reasons that um, industry proposed these regulatory revisions. Um, the first being to reduce regulatory discards. Um, but the second is because calculating of MRAs um, for the duration of time at sea can be very complicated. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that a lot of vessels are participating in multiple management programs at the same time. And that includes catcher vessels, not just CPs and motherships. Um, for CPs and motherships, it's even more complicated because they're often acting as CPs and motherships at the same time. Those vessels are often staying out at sea for multiple weeks. And as you saw earlier, there's five different triggers that restart a fishing trip for the MRA calculations. So this table that you're looking at, this is a, an example that was provided to us by industry. Um, it's an example of an Amendment 80 vessel that's acting as both a CP and a mothership and participating in three separate management programs. Um, and this, uh, the table indicates the number of fishing trips that they are keeping track of. So in each row header, you can see the management programs they're participating in. So in this case, it includes Amendment 80, Open Access, and CDQ. This vessel spent 11 days total out at sea and then I'm just going to walk you through the Amendment 80 row, um, just so you can orient your, yourselves a little bit about how the table works. So for the first day, day one, the Amendment 80, um, under the Amendment 80 program, they're fishing in an area that's open to Pacific Cod and open to Aka Mackerel. So they're in fishing trip number one. On day two, they move to an area that's closed to Pacific Cod. And because they're moving into an area with a different fishing prohibition, it triggers a new fish, it, it figures, triggers a new fishing trip um, for the purposes of MRAs. So now they're in um, fishing trip number two. 
On day three, they move back to the other area they were already in. They can add that on to fishing trip number one. But day three is also Saturday, which is the end of a weekly reporting period, which means on day four, Sunday, they're automatically in a new fishing trip. So that's fishing trip number three. Then during that week, day four to day 10, they're moving in and out of closed areas, and that creates one additional fishing trip for fishing trip number four. Day 10 is Saturday, again, the end of um, a weekly reporting period. So on day 11, on Sunday, they're automatically in fishing trip number five. So they're doing this for each management program that they are participating in. So they have uh, five trips for Amendment 80, uh, three fishing trips for open access, and four fishing trips for CDQ for a total of 12 fishing trips for their 11 days at sea. So this isn't the only thing they're keeping track of. They also have to keep track of all the basis species within each of those fishing trips. And they have to calc calculate the MRAs for every incidental species that they are catching, which could be uh, quite a few. In addition, most MRAs are instantaneous. So that means at no point in time can they be over the MRA during that fishing trip. So for every single haul, they have to ensure that they're not over those instantaneous MRAs. And then on top of that, um, Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Pollock and Bering Sea Aka Mackerel, are, um, the MRAs are calculated at the time of the offload. And so those two species have to be um, calculated and have to be kept track of separately from the rest of these to ensure that they're not over the MRA at the time of the offload. So you can see how this very quickly can get very, very complicated. And there's a lot of room in here for um, vessels to uh, make little errors in the way they're doing the calculations. All right, so a little more detail about the proposed revisions. So a revision one would uh, redefine the fishing trip for CPs and motherships from five to two triggers. The proposed triggers to remain would be the offload of all product, and um, the use of a different gear type. That means for CPs and motherships, the triggers that um, would go that would be eliminated would include um, the end of a weekly reporting period, um, when the vessel enters an area with a different fishing trip prohibition, or if there's a notification of a different um, if there's a notification of a different fishing prohibition in the same area where the vessel already is. Under this revision, the instantaneous MRAs would remain in place. Um, but also under this revision, it would provide opportunity for vessels to potentially target a species that is closed to directed fishing in a closed area. And I'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. Revision 1A was to add some additional species to the offload calculation. Um, it was proposed to add the other IRIU species to the offload calculation because the offload calculation um, typically results in less discarding. And part of the uh, purpose of the IRIU program is to reduce discards. So that would include adding Gulf of Alaska Pollock, Gulf of Alaska Pacific Cod, and Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Pacific Cod. But the AP might want to also consider adding Gulf of Alaska shallow water flatfish because that's also an IRIU species, but it wasn't in the original um, comment letter. It's also proposed to add Central Gulf of Alaska rockfish program to an offload calculation. And that one is currently being done at the end of each weekly reporting period. Um, moving it to an offload calculation would put it more in line with how we're doing other species. So when a MRA is being calculated at the time of offload, that means there's no longer an instantaneous MRA for that species. They just need to be under the MRA whenever they offload. Um, this could result in more MRA overages if a vessel returns to port unexpectedly, and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, here in a bit. Um, and it would also likely lower regulatory disc discards of these specific species, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Lauren. Thank you so much for the presentation um, through the chair. So I, I think one thing I'm curious about is under the revisions, we're not disincentivizing MRAs. We're we're helping to kind of maximize MRAs. So if there's any discussion around like fishing behavior and changes in fishing behavior because of this. Um, and then another thing I'm curious about is maybe looking at like have the MRA allocations been fully utilized year over year, or maybe what that looks like just to have an idea of how that could shift in time. 
Through the chair. Yeah, those are excellent questions. And um, that's something that was not fully looked at since this is just a discussion paper. But I think if this moved forward into an analysis, those are things we would definitely want to look at in more detail. Thank you. Any other questions? Please continue. Okay, uh, revision uh, two would again redefine the fishing trip triggers for CPs and motherships from five to two. I'm not going to talk about that one again. And it would also calculate all MRAs at the time of offload for all species. So that means that there would not be any instantaneous MRAs for any species anymore. Under this revision, all species would be treated the same. So there might be less confusion on how to calculate your MRAs. Um, but it may also result in more MRA overages if the vessel returns to port um, unexpectedly. Um, this revision would also likely result in the least amount of regulatory discards. And again, we'll, I'll talk about those last two issues in a, in a few minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Krista. <clears throat> I guess on the previous slide. Okay. Um, so I understand that this is the way that it was presented by industry, which was to put these two things together. Um, but I guess my question is, is, does it make sense to also separate these out into two kind of different mutually exclusive issues? So separating out kind of redefine, redefining fishing trip for CPs and motherships into kind of one issue, and then separately looking at sort of calculating all MRAs, moving to offload to offload. Um, and looking at that separately. So I guess, is am I thinking about that correctly that we could basically separate those two things? Thanks. Yes, through the chair. Yeah, the discussion paper and this presentation is just laid out the way that the original industry comment letter was presented, um, but it certainly makes um, sense to uh, separate out the redefining the fishing trip definitions separately from the changing species to an offload calculation. Yeah. Thanks. Just one more question. Sorry. Um, and, and I guess also is one of the reasons for that because the redefining the fishing trip is specific to CPs and motherships. And then the second piece of this, which is thinking about changing the MRA accounting that would be applicable to more sectors than just CPs and motherships. Is that correct? Through the chair. Yeah. I think that's a good way to look at it. The, um, the redefining of the fishing trip would just be for CPs and motherships. And the way that the industry co uh, comment letter was um, outlined, the changing the calculation of MRAs to an offload could apply to any sector, including catcher vessels. All right. Okay, so um, if these revisions were put in place, um, either of the revisions were put in place, it would reduce the number of fishing trip calculations for CPs and motherships. Um, it would make it easier for industry to calculate um, their MRAs and hopefully less error prone. Um, we also have our Office of Law Enforcement who is having to calculate all these MRAs as well. Um, and although um, they are able to do that, it would be easier um, under, this, under these revisions. Um, this table is just the same example that we saw earlier. Under either of these revisions, you can see that each of the management programs would only have one fishing trip for their 11 days at sea. Um, under revision one, they'd still be responsible for um, instantaneous MRAs. Under revision two, the MRAs would be calculated at the time of offload, so they would just make sure that they were not over those MRAs at the time of offload. Either one of the industry revisions would likely reduce uh, regulatory discards, um, but also either of the revisions would provide opportunity for vessels to target a species that's closed to directed fishing in a closed area. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. There is one IRIU consideration um, that comes up as a result of these revisions. So if you think back when I was talking about in the agency section, how for a catcher vessel, the most restrictive MRA for the area that they fished is the MRA that is applicable for the duration of the fishing trip. So this regulation also exists for motherships and CPs. Um, however, it's not currently an issue because when the vessel is entering an area with a new fishing, a different fishing prohibition, the fishing trip is starting over. 
should this regulation remain in place while one of these industry proposed revisions is also um, initiated, then we would also uh, create that conflict between which one takes precedence, um, the MRA regulations or the IORU regulations. Um, we currently tell CVs that the MRA regulations take precedence over IRU, and if that was the case here, then it would likely be very limiting for catcher processors, and it would likely increase regulatory discards. So the AP might want to consider whether or not it's appropriate for that regulation to remain in place, or if that regulation should be changed as well. All right, uh, moving on to unforeseen issues uh, that requires a vessel to return to port. This is one of the things the council asked us to look at in um, their motion. There's a couple of different reasons why a vessel might return um, to port unexpectedly. That includes a medical emergency, and a mechanical emergency, or um, bad weather. So um, we actually, weather is not discussed in the discussion paper, um, but I wanted to add it to the presentation because when we were reaching out to other sectors, one of the things we heard specifically from catcher vessels was that they often do have to return to port unexpectedly due to weather, especially if there is, um, especially for smaller catcher vessels. So the AP might want to consider um, weather as one of the reasons um, that vessels return. So there's um, two different kinds of MRA overages that can occur when a vessel returns to port unexpectedly. The first is the vessel could be over the MRA of a species that's calculated at the time of the offload. Um, if the vessel returns to port and offloads any of their fish or fish product, then they would be in violation of this MRA regulation. Um, but of course, most vessels want to offload when they come into port, even if it's unexpectedly, because it's economically more sound to return out to the grounds with empty holds. Um, the other kind of MRA overage that can occur is they could be over an instantaneous MRA. But being over an instantaneous MRA is always a violation because at no point during uh, the fishing trip is a vessel allowed to be over the MRA. Under any of the revisions that would add more species to an offload calculation, this issue would likely be um, exasperated. The AP might want to consider some regulatory relief for when these unexpected situations arise, but if the AP wants to do that, you should, you should consider what actually constitutes an emergency. If there's any amount over the MRA that's actually acceptable under this, these situa situations, and um, whether or not catch from that trip should be rolled into the next trip for the MRA calculations or any other solutions that the AP wants to come up with. Thank you. If we could pause briefly, we have a question online from Julie Cavanaugh. Julie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you through the chair. I was um, maybe just needing some clarification between the two bullet points under issue where vessel may be over MRA of species calculated at offload versus the one below it, they, um, I guess, currently wouldn't just the last bullet be, um, I mean, I don't understand the difference between the two because right now we don't have like an MRA based on what you might have, might have brought in if you didn't come in at that point. Uh, they're just, they're just, okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right, through the uh, chair, um, Ms. Kavanaugh. Um, so the first bullet is, so there are some species that are currently being calculated at the time of offload. So that includes Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, Pollock, and Bering Sea, Aka Mackerel. And so um, while you're out fishing for those species, you can be over the instantaneous MRA for those species at that point in time, as long as the vessel feels confident that they're going to get enough basis species before they offload so that when they offload, they're not over the MRA. Um, so if a, if a vessel comes into port unexpectedly, then they might have fished those species early on in their trip, expecting that they're going to stay out at sea for an additional 10 days um, and accumulate more basis species. Um, and they might think that they're going to be under the MRA as long as they're able to stay out at sea as long as they had, uh, had originally expected. The second bullet point is for instantaneous MRA. So all other species are calculated on an instantaneous MRA, which means at no point in time, at no, no minute of your um, fishing trip, 
can you be over that MRA? So you should never be over that MRA ever. So that's that's the difference in the clarification between that two. And I um, let me know if that's still confusing. Yep, no, that's helpful because because I don't um, do mackerel or pollock, I wasn't aware that they were, I think it's in the paper, but I didn't retain that information that they are calculated at offload. So that makes sense why the two are separated. So there would be information available on those two species that are calculated at offload as to like how often um, return to port or to a mothership happened and caused um, a, a problem with being over? Through the chair, uh, yes. Um, and that's something, if this moves forward to an analysis, that we could look at um, closer based on the species that are already um, calculated at the time of offload. Thank you. And, and another question, if I may, um, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yeah. So when you spoke to the Pollock and macro, you um, you said that it's possible that a vessel may have went out to get their uh maximum ICA of the MRA and then ended up coming in early for some unknown reason. Um, if, if, if all species were calculated at offload, would we expect that front loading of these um, MRA species potentially? Uh, through the chair, I don't know if expect is quite the right word, but um, certainly they could do that. If if the, a species was calculated at the time of offload, if a vessel gets out and they happen to be on good grounds for um, an ICA species that they're interested in retaining, they could retain that early on in the trip. Yes. Yeah. And I kind of understand that that's um, because some uh, maybe if they're without even trying, they might end up in that situation. But then also um, on the other side of that, if um, if the ICA is calculated when um, let's say a mothership does offload a of fish or fish product, there could there also be a potential where they're under their percentage of ICA and they try to meet the maximum at the end of that period of time? Uh, through the chair, yes, they could do that now. Their only requirement is that they're under the MRA at the time of the offload. And so if a vessel wishes to top off on an incidental species to stay and still be under the MRA, um, that is allowed. Okay, and then um, I'll, I'll, I'll hold back on questions. Thank you. Thank you. Annika. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Krista. Would it be fair to characterize this line of questioning as kind of um, potential changes in fishing behavior that may come out in a, if the AP decided to forward an initial review analysis that these are the kinds of things that could be looked at under that? Yes, through the chair. Um, since this is only a discussion paper, that's that this kind of information is not looked at thoroughly right now. Um, but if this was moved forward to an analysis, um, that's definitely the kind of information we would want to look at. Lauren. Thank you for entertaining all these questions. Um, I guess on the the question of um get back to the presentation. Too many tabs open. There we go. Um what we would need to suggest or change in regulation if one of these occurrences happen. Is this something where like the vessel would just need to call in and say, hey, this happened? You know, like we have that, we had that temporarily for sablefish pots before they changed regulation. If something happened, you had to leave your pots on the ground where you couldn't, you just had to contact agency when you came to port. Is is that all they're looking for? Or are they looking for like a written regulation of these are the specific things that, that you know, qualify as an unforeseen event. I mean, how, I guess, how specific are, are, are we needing to go into that? So through the chair, that is an excellent question um, and not something that we were able to ascertain in the discussion paper because it was a, it's a little unclear, like what the expectation would be for regulatory relief. I think that's up to the AP's interpretation on um, how they would 
want to proceed, if if they want to proceed with some kind of relief, if it would be something that's clear, clear in regulation, that if you meet these certain conditions, then you would um, be exempt from the MRA regulations, or if it was something a little more loose, like you said, that you would call in and maybe get um, permission or confirmation that it's okay to come back to port and be over the MRAs. I think that that's totally up for um, the AP's interpretation. So fair to say this is something that needs to be discussed further in the next iteration. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you through the chair. Um, thanks, Krista. And so wouldn't it also be fair to say that in the in the analysis, um, the reason this would need to be flushed out further is also because when we don't spell things out in clearly in regulation, there be, can be confusions or changes in the interpretation of the regulations when um, even by individual people or as people change and and so it's good to be have clarity. Yeah, through the chair. It's always better and easier for clarification for everyone, both um, for the region, for OLE, as well as for industry, to have it clearly spelled out in regulation. That's always the easiest um, way to go, for sure. Thank you. I see Julie's hand is up. Julie, is that a legacy hand, or do you have another question? And it's down. All right, thank you. Please continue. All right, uh, moving on to regulatory discards. So um, one of the goals of the proposed re uh, revisions um, submitted by industry was to reduce regulatory discards. I have a couple of slides on this. So first I wanna go through how regulatory discards work under the status quo um, for motherships and CPs. And then I will go through how some of these proposed revisions might affect regulatory discards. So for the purposes of, um, of this slide, I'm only gonna talk about instantaneous MRAs. And so again, you cannot be over an MRA at any time during the fishing trip if it's under an instantaneous MRA. Under the status quo, and I'm just gonna talk about CPs and motherships here, a CP and mothership can be engaged in multiple fishing trips um, while they're out at sea. And the MRA calculation starts over every time they enter a new fishing trip. So I'm gonna use an example here just to illustrate how that works. So imagine that there's a CP hook and line vessel who's fishing for Pacific cod in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. And that vessel is fishing for two weekly reporting periods. On day one, week one, that vessel harvests 10 metric tons of Pacific cod and five metric tons of skates and the MRA for skates is 20%. Under this situation, the vessel can only retain two metric tons of skates and has to discard three metric tons of skates. Otherwise, they'll be over the instantaneous MRA because they only have 10 metric tons of a basis species on board at that, at that time. On day one, week two, the vessel has 100 metric tons of Pacific cod and three metric tons of skates on board from the previous week. But now, because we're in a new weekly reporting period, a new fishing trip has been triggered, so the MRA calculations are starting over. On day one, week two, the vessel again harvests 10 metric tons of Pacific cod and five metric tons of skates, and the vessel again can only retain two metric tons of skates and must discard three metric tons of skates because they cannot be over the instantaneous MRA for um, the fishing trip they're currently in, and they cannot consider the 100 metric tons of Pacific cod from the previous week. So now we'll look at how that works under the revised, or how this might work under the revi uh, proposed revised cha changes. So the first uh, part of the industry proposal was to revise the fishing trip trigger from five to two. This uh, revision would still require that discarding occurs to be under the instantaneous MRA, but the MRA calculations would not start over multiple times while at sea. So if we think back to our CP and hook and line vessel, that vessel would have had to have discarded their skates on day one, week one, but on day one, week two, that vessel could have retained all of its skates because then it was able to look at the Pacific cod that was harvested from the previous week. So under this revision, it would there would likely be less discarding um, throughout the trip, 
And if there was discarding, it would likely occur more often towards the beginning of the trip as the vessel tries to accumulate as much basis species as they can. The second part of that was to add additional species to an offload calculation. And so those species would no longer have an instantaneous MRA. Um, that would likely result in less discarding of those particular species. Revision two was to add all MRAs um, to be calculated at the time of offload. So that would mean that no species had an instantaneous MRA. So if we think back to our CP hook and line vessel, that vessel could have retained all of their skates on day one, week one, and all of their skates on day one, week two. Um, and that's that's because as long as the vessel had confidence that they were going to have enough basis species by the time they offloaded to cover those skates, then they could keep those skates. Um, this revision would likely result in the less, the least amount of regulatory discarding, especially for high value species. There's a few other considerations that you should think about when, you, when we're talking about regulatory discards. There are some species that have some mandatory retention rules. Um, but most species do not. So in order for regulatory discards to be reduced, a vessel actually has to want to retain those species. So again, if we think about our CP hook and line vessel, that vessel was actually not required to keep any of their skates and could have discarded all of their skates. So we're only reducing regulatory discards in that case if the vessel actually wants to keep that species. The other thing is that vessels uh, might end up discarding more at the end of the trip to avoid being over their offload MRAs. And that's something that we could probably look at in an analysis um, based on the species that are already calculated at the time of offload. All right, I'm gonna move on to closed areas. All right. So I'm sure as everyone knows, there's a lot of closed areas um, in Alaskan waters and that are closed to directed fishing for specific species. Um, this is the, these are the cellar sea lion species. So Pacific cod, pollock, and aca mackerel. Those areas are closed to directed fishing. Um, anything over the MRA for a species is considered directed fishing by regulation. Under current regulation, there, a new fishing trip is triggered when a CP or mothership enters an area with a different fishing prohibition. And um, that's, that regulation is in place in part to, um, to uh, supply less opportunity for a vessel to target a species that's close to directed fishing within the closed area. If you remove that trip trigger um, for for a new trip when a vessel enters a, a closed area, then that would give a vessel an opportunity to target a species that's closed to directed fishing within that closed area. And that's because the MRA cal calculation would be based on the amount on board for the entire time the vessel was at sea. So as long as the vessel was within their instantaneous MRA under uh, the proposed revision one, or um, under the MRA at the time of offload um, in revision number two, um, the vessel would not be considered having directed fished in the closed area and it would not be a violation. The Office of Law Enforcement has expressed some concern about the ability to enforce closed areas under these circumstances. And I just wanna give some a little bit of context on a past action that has taken place um, at the council. So Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Pollock was moved to an offload calculation, um, I think it was in 2004. In 2006, the council saw a very similar action to this um, regarding adding some additional species to an offload calculation. At that time, the council also was concerned about the opportunities of a vessel uh, uh, targeting species inside closed areas. Um, the council did um, pass that motion, but they did amend it to read that a species would be calculated at the time of offload unless the vessel entered a closed area, um, and then that would still trigger a new fishing trip. Uh, NIMS uh, published a proposed rule, um, but received a lot of feedback from industry stating that um, keeping that trip trigger, trip trigger when they enter a closed area would um, not meet the goal of reducing regulatory discards and would be costly to participants. So in the end, NIMS ended up withdrawing that proposed rule and those regulations never went into effect. 
Um, several years later, I believe around uh, 2014, um, Bering Sea Accomac Pearl was, was actually added to a offload calculation. So that's just some of the background um, regarding that, uh, regarding closed areas. So regarding the enforcement of closed areas, this is an issue that exists currently right now, separate from any of the changes that may be contemplated as part of this action. Is that correct? Um, through the chair, yes, that is correct. So um, Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Pollock and Bering Sea Aka Mackerel already have an offload calculation. Um, and so there is some opportunity there for vessels to target um, those species um, inside a closed area. Chelsea. Thank you through the chair. I'm just wondering, I get that it wouldn't, it doesn't currently exist in regulation, but why couldn't observer data be used to determine whether a vessel was targeting, especially since like CPs are carrying two observers? Through the chair, it's a very good question. Um, I think it's important to understand the difference between directed fishing, which is a regulatory term and defined in regulation. The violation comes, comes when you are actually directed fishing, which is any amount over the MRA. So it's deeply tied to the MRAs. Um, targeting um, is not defined in, in, in regulation, or I don't believe it is. Um, it's, but it's a term that we use to say, this is the majority of what was caught in that haul. But that is not the same thing as directed fishing. Um, it, you are correct in that we do have observers on board and we do have um, some daily um, other reports that are required from the at sea fleet for CPs and mothership. So we do actually have that information. Um, but targeting is not targeting a species inside a closed area is not a violation. It's the directed fishing of that species, which is determined on um, the MRAs. Monica. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So you're saying that you do have the information to figure out whether or not this behavior is happening or not, but because of the direct definition of directed fishing, it could still be a violation. Is that, I guess, can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Thanks. Uh, through the chair, yes, we, we do have the information from observer data. So we can determine if someone is targeting a species inside a closed area. It's just that it's not necessarily in, an enforceable action unless directed fishing has occurred, which is based on the MRAs. So if you're over the MRA, you, you're only considered directed fishing if you're over the MRA. And so you can target a species and still be under the MRA in the end. And then, you, and so as a result, you haven't directed fish. So there's no enforcement action that can be taken. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you through the chair. So I'm just wondering, is there, has there been any thought on the agency side or is this something that could be included in an analysis for these particular situations, having some way to use that other information in an enforceable way to, you know, so that these changes could pass while still showing that vessels wouldn't change behavior by fishing in those closed areas and directed fishing? Through the chair. Uh, yeah, I think if this moved forward to an analysis that this is something we would want to look at very closely. Um, and that's one of the things we could look at. And then if, um, you know, if the AP and the, and the council wants to prohibit targeting inside these closed areas, then that's something that could definitely be looked at in an analysis or through any kind of motion. Thank you. Patty. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm getting more confused as we go here. Uh, directed fishing is, I believe, if you go over the MRA, you're classed as directed fishing. And targeting in the in, in the DFL, the, the daily fishing logbook, there's a box for target. And years ago, I put down code 710 for sable fish. It was an MRA species. And enforcement told me that that was not allowed. Because you're not targeting you're not supposed to target sable fish because it's a it's it's an MRA species 
or incidental catch on their MRAs. And and so basically what he told me is you need to lie on the logbook and put something else down. But you can't put down the MRA species as a target species. But what you're saying is that target doesn't matter. It's directed fishing. So I'm a little confused. Through the chair, I can't speak to what a, a, an officer from the Office of Law Enforcement has said in the past, but by regulation, it's the directed fishing that matters, not the targeting. Thank you. Lauren. So I guess to clarify that, you can directed fish for an MRA species? Or you can target? You can in, in target the directed or the MRA species? That's, I think that's where I'm <laughs> following. Through the chair, yes, you can target a um, MRA or incidental catch species, um, meaning that in your haul, the majority of that catch is that incidental species, um, which would be targeting. Then I think that's why I struggled with the semantics in my first question of incidental. Is that is that fair to say? <laughs> Uh, through the chair, yes. And as you can see, MRAs get more and more complicated the more you delve into them. <sighs> Thanks for that. Uh, please go on. All right. We are coming up on the end here. Um, so uh, this the information on this slide is not in the discussion paper, but we did reach out to some additional um, uh industry sectors to get their, their take on um, the proposed industry um, revisions. And there was a couple of things that came up I just want to cover here. Um, one was how would fleet behavior change if the MRA regulations are revised? That's something that many of you have already picked up on. Um, that mostly seems to be um, directed towards whether or not the Bering Sea Pacific Cod non-CDQ sector would be harvested faster, causing the Bering Sea to close earlier to directed fishing for Pacific Cod. Um, as many of you might be aware, the um, directed fishery for Pacific Cod in the Bering Sea has been closing um, the last few years in early fall or mid-fall. Um, I will state that currently all Pacific cod is an IRIU species. That's for all sectors under all management programs. That means if it's open to directed fishing, vessels already have to retain all of their Pacific cod. If it's closed to directed fishing, um, all vessels um, have to keep their Pacific cod up to the MRA, so they're not allowed to discard. Um, Pacific cod is also an Amendment 80 allocated and hard cap species, so that means they're also under the IRIU regulations and have to retain all of their Pacific cod. Um, and also because it's hard capped, Amendment 80 is trying to uh, manage their Pacific cod in such a way as to ensure that they have enough remaining to, to fully harvest their other allocated species. Um, it seems unlikely that Amendment 80 fleet behavior and other sector fleet behavior would change in such a way as to cause directed fishing for Pacific Cod to close earlier than it already has been. But of course, this is something we could look at closer in a, in a full analysis if this should move forward. The other question we've received is how or if this would affect the trawl EM M MRAs. Um, trawl EM is for electronic monitoring. Um, these regulations aren't in place yet, and the final rule has not yet been published, but the proposed rule is out, and these vessels are currently operating under an EFP. Um, it requires currently um, under the EFP and within the proposed rule, um, EM would be required um, to keep 100% of all, um, all species um, that they harvested or that they caught um, with a few dis discarding exceptions such as large sharks or some invertebrates. Um, we would not expect the proposed MRA modifications um, to change how the trial EM MRAs um, would work and that they would be the same as how they're outlined currently in the proposed rule, um, barring any uh, changes between the proposed rule and the final rule. All right, we are at the end now. So um, the task of the AP is to recommend whether or not they want to move forward um, into an analysis, the NIMPS proposed changes, which were summarized in table 7-1 of the discussion paper, and also to decide whether or not they want to move forward, you want to move forward um, with all or some of the industry proposed changes, which are outlined in um, table 7-2. 
If uh, the AP would like to move forward into analysis, then what information would be beneficial into that in that analysis? And this could could include information such as regulatory discards, um, further a further look at closed areas, IRU, and um, any unforeseen reasons that a vessel might return to port, and whether or not the modification should apply to all vessel sectors and all management programs or, or not. And that concludes the presentation, and hopefully you're not too confused about MRAs. Um, I will gladly take any other questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Do we have other questions? Shannon, go ahead. It's not a question, but I, I just a comment. I think this presentation gives a glimpse of how challenging your job is and the rest of the NCs and staff. And just from an industry perspective, we really appreciate all the work that you do because without um, your ability to understand all this and help us figure it out, we, we wouldn't be able to be, be fishing. So thank you. And thanks to all your, your uh, coworkers. Thank you. Not seeing any other questions. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, up next, I think we'll go right into public testimony. Uh, following public testimony, we'll take a break before we take a motion. Um, up first, we have Chad C. Following Mr. C, we'll have Julie Bonney. There are only three people signed up for public testimony at this time. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the AP, I uh, will get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, my name is Chad C. I'm the Executive Director of the Freezer of Online Coalition. I'm commenting in regards to agenda item D2 here today, examining <clears throat> possible adjustments to ground fish MRAs. FLC also submitted written comments on this action, so I will be summarizing the key points from our letter. <clears throat> FLC supports moving this discussion paper forward for initial review. This action will facilitate needed con consideration of measures developed by NIMS and industry to simplify MRA calculations and minimize discards of MRA species. In moving this forward, we ask the AP incorporate considerations into the analysis to consider just to address potential impacts of MRA changes to the directed bearing sea cod harvest and to the calculation and amount of hook and line CP MRAs for skates. First, we ask that the analysis include consideration of potential behavioral changes by vessels resulting from changes to the calculation of MRAs. We specifically are interested in the potential for changes to result in the increase of non-target harvest of Bering Sea Pacific cod. We appreciate the staff comments here this morning on this matter, and our expectation is that these impacts would likely be minimal. That said, we, given the potential for any increase in non-target harvest to further contribute to the early closures of the Bering Sea Pacific cod fishery, it's important that this matter be taken up in, as part of the analysis. Second, we ask that the analysis include a specific look at potential changes to the calculation of hook and line CP MRAs for skates. This should include applying the skate MRA for hook and line CPs at the time of offload and doing away with the instantaneous MRA calculation and the weekly reporting period. Our vessel operators usually have an idea of what the total catch of COD will be for a given trip, and therefore we would also know what the trip level skate, uh, skate catch would be as a percentage. This would allow for more efficient management of their skate catch during the trip. We expect that this analysis would demonstrate that such a change would lead to a reduction in, in regulatory discards by our vessels. Section 6.1 of the paper specifically speaks to scape catch by our fleet and similarly suggests that a switch to an offload to, to offload MRA application would contribute to a reduction in scape discards. We believe that action to minimize the scape discards would be consistent with NIFS's recently released national seafood strategy, specifically its first stated goal to maintain or increase sustainable wild capture production. Minimizing discards to help will help to optimize utilization and production of our harvest of skates and provide much needed additional revenues to support our operators and crew who continue to face historically challenging market conditions for, for Pacific cod and rising costs that are ever that are creating ever thinning more operating margins for our fleet. The approach will also create more simplicity in the application of the MRA, facilitating less uncertainty between vessels and regulators on MRA harvests on a given trip. One modification to our request in our written comments is to apply this change to the application of the MRA to the AI and GOA skates in addition to the Bering Sea. Including GOA and AI skates as part of this action would alleviate potential operational and enforcement challenges that come with different MRA accounting for one species depending on, an, on area. 
Third, we ask that the an analysis expect examine options for allowing for an exemption from the state MRA in the event of an unforeseen medical or mechanical issue during a trip. Section 5.2 of the discussion paper speaks to the potential for violations when a vessel experiences such issues and suggests this to be something that can be examined more closely in a full analysis. We support this being part of the analysis as a matter of fairness to operators who have no choice but to return to port when such unforeseen matters come up. Lastly, we ask that the analysis include consideration of increasing this BSEI skate MRA percentage for our fleet. Currently, our BSEI skate MRA when targeting Pacific Cod is 20%. The intent of considering an increase is to further minimize regulatory discards of skate and in the process improve utilization of the resource. Recently, FLC members have been experiencing increased market demand for smaller skates in addition to the traditional market for larger skates. This creates the opportunity for our vessels to generate additional revenue through increased retention of encounter skates. We would not anticipate an increase to the in the MRA to markedly impact fleet behavior on the harvester skates or alone an increase to the overall harvest of the stock. As we look at efforts to minimize discards of MRA species, we believe it's an appropriate time to examine a change in the MRA percentage as part of this action. With that said, given the potential complexities of looking at that kind of change, we wouldn't be amenable to taking this matter up in a separate action. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. C. It looks like we have a question for you from Chelsea. Chelsea, go ahead. Thank you through the chair. Thanks, Chad, for your testimony. I was just wondering if you had a specific range for increasing the Bering Seascape um, MRA or if you were just open to um, a, a look at a range. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chelsea, through the chair. In our comment letter, we <clears throat> suggested a range of up to 30% from 20%. I think we're pretty open to looking at that, though, in a discussion paper. That was uh, something we put in for, for discussion itself. So um, we're amenable to that. Thank you. Does the AP have Paul? Go ahead. Through the chair. Thanks for your testimony, Chad. I was just uh, um, uh, wanted to get a sort of a little bit better idea of of sort of the decision making that's going on while it, while the boats are at sea, so you said that there's 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 historical markets for larger skates, and then there's some markets for for that are are uh, coming open for smaller skates, and um, sort of on a obviously there's a, um, a there's clearly a, a limitation on the sort of overall number of skates that you can keep based on the MRAs, but um, what what decisions go into whether a vessel keeps certain skates, is it based on certain species of skates? Is it based on on the size? Is it based on um, some something else? I guess. So, I just wonder if you can sort of elaborate on that because it it sounds like you're not planning, e even if the MRA was removed completely, the the intent wouldn't be to sort of start targeting skates and keeping a hundred percent of skates. There's still some level of 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 discard that's going to happen so i was wondering if you can sort of talk about that a little bit sure uh paul through the chair uh the, my understanding uh it'd be a great question for a, a fisherman um who's out there uh, doing this right now but um my my understanding is that traditionally it's been by size uh on the skates and and so there's been the markets for the larger skates and those have been uh kept more uh, i think as was noted in the in our in the staff presentation there's no requirement for disc for us to keep or discard any of those skates um uh but up to that MRA amount um but the usually it's been by size um but of late there's been uh been uh, more of that market for the smaller skates so there's been a more uh, some decision making in terms of keeping some of the smaller skates as well uh and uh, my understanding from uh just talking with our captains on the Bering Sea side at least that there's been more just more encounter of the of those skates um but that's something we've been looking at uh trying to look at some more as well in terms of whether that um is consistent with the data okay so then just to follow up then so so there's particular skates that you would be looking for um and so at the beginning of the trip first couple of days or so if you're encountering large numbers of those skates the mras require you to, to discard certain percentage of those but um if you're seeing the smaller numbers uh the larger numbers of the skates that are less desirable then then the um then they're just being discarded so um sort of 
as the vet the, the vessel goes through a trip whatever it is 15 30 days um it's sort of encountering potentially different populations of of desirable skates versus undesirable skates so liberal liberalizing the mras may sort of help with sort of that uh randomized encounter um situation that that the boats are seeing would, would that be fair to characterize uh, thanks, Paul, through the chair. I think that's a fair consideration uh, for assessment of that um, uh, in terms of just how they how our captains might be viewing that uh, when they're looking to heart to execute their harvest. So, thank you. I appreciate the answers. I, I didn't see a um, a captain signed up for testimony, so I thought you were maybe the best person to start with. Doing the best I can. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um. Not seeing any other questions. Thank you for your testimony today. Sure. Thank you. Up next, we have Julie Bonney, and then uh, public testimony on D2 will conclude with Todd Loomis and Glenn Merrill. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. Um, members of the AP, um, this is your last day. Congratulations. <laughs> Long week, but um, my name is Julie Bonney, and I represent the members of Alaska Groundfish Data Bank, which are trawl catcher vessels that are home port mostly home ported out of Kodiak and uh, um, shoreside processors. So just to be clear about what's in this package for catcher vessels, because there's a lot of discussion about CPs and motherships, for catcher vessels that are actually delivering shoreside, there's really only two elements in what is in the discussion paper as proposals that benefit the catcher vessel sector. One is the uh, moving from instantaneous MRAs to offload MRAs. And if you really think about um, the reality of how that can be enforced, um, if at least it, it's very difficult um, to actually enforce an instantaneous versus an offload, especially on a trawl vessel where all the catch is going into the RSW tank. So I think from a clarity point of view, just moving to the offload is gonna work a lot better for all CVs. Then the other issue that I think is beneficial is the issue of a mechanical issue in terms of coming in and you're over the MRA because you have to come back to port early. So though those are the two elements I think in this package that benefits the CV sector. Then moving into the issue that um, Chad had raised, um, we have a species in the Gulf of Alaska, POP, that is problematic hands down in terms of the MRA. The MRA for POP is a 5% aggregate rockfish that was set in the 1990s when POP was overfished. Now POP is probably either the second or third largest biomass in the Gulf of Alaska. So you move, and so what we find is that POP and Pollock are habitating together. They just had the, and that's probably not the right word, but we just did the Shelikoff survey debriefing from the Dyson, and they were talking about tight balls of POP and Pollock together along the shelf break, and that they can't tell the difference because of the electronics, nor can fishermen. And so the only way that they could figure out what was in those tight balls was to actually do a trawl to see what the composition was. So then you move into the reality of what the fishermen are seeing. So in uh, um, the because of trawl EM, they're required to keep everything that they catch. And so they're, when we will be recording all the MRA overages because you're exempted in the IPAs. And so um, from a public perspe pers perspective, I really don't like the idea of having a large number of POP overages reported on an annual basis, knowing that that number was set when POP was overfished and it's super abundant and we're gonna have a really hard time staying away from it. So I believe that that number needs to change. If you look at what is in the rockfish program, 
that we use a 20% MRA for Pollock. I think the MRA for POP should be 20% as well. And just to give you an idea what a problem it is, in season actually sets aside an ICA amount for POP in the Gulf of Alaska, in the central Gulf of 3,500 tons. To, so that, because normally you allocate your so to the rockfish program, which is a, a lap, but because there's so much POP on the grounds, we actually have to set aside 3,500 tons to support that catch. So going back to what this is all about, it's about regulatory discards, right? And also public perspective and what's going on in the new trolley M program. So I'm asking that POP get a separate um, percentage, not part of, don't raise ORAP from 5% to 20%, but POP gets a separate number in the basis species and um, your MRA in terms of table 10. So hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. We have uh, multiple questions. First, we'll go to Julie, who's online, and then Chelsea, then Lauren. Uh, go ahead, Julie. Yeah, thank you, Brian, through the chair. Thank you, Julie, for your testimony. Can you um, give me a quick um, explanation of the, the seasons, um, when Pollock is open and when POP is open? Um, so... <laughs> Pollock is open. Um, the A season is from January 20th until May 31. And, and then the B season is from September 1 till November 1. The rockfish program is from May 1st through um, November 15th, but the, you don't have any overlap of those fisheries because you check into the rockfish program to target rockfish. And then when you're in the Pollock fishery, you're in the open access environment. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And then a follow-up question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Julie. So there's no, oppor Julie, sorry, there's no opportunity to um, utilize whatever POP you catch when you are targeting Pollock um, and when, because they're not both, you're not, you're not at, you, so like in the sablefish, you're, anybody that has sablefish IFQs can um, credit caught sablefish in like a, a fixed gear long line situation to their IFQs. And I know that we're not talking about rationalized um, fisheries, but that you don't have that ability to utilize it in that way where you could take it off your POP tack. You have to use it as a ICA under an MRA situation. That's correct. Okay, thank you. It's it's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> you articulated it really well, actually, Julie. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Chelsea and then Lauren. Thank you through the chair. Um, so I just want to go back. I had two questions, but I already forgot the second. So first, I'm just going to go back to what you were talking about um, in terms of the instantaneous versus at offload calculations. So can you just clarify for me um, if a the way, it, even though the MRA for non-EM vessels is currently instantaneous, how is, is the actual fine at the MRA calculated to offload based on the e-landings on the fish ticket? It, it is, but I guess the, the, the instantaneous means that if you got the wrong species, you most likely discard it at sea, right? But the fine in terms of OLE happens at the, based on what's delivered, yes. Right. Okay. So I'm just trying to indicate that the fines would still occur at the same time for MRAs, regardless of this change. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Lauren. Julie asked my question and then I just kind of had another one come up. So I'll continue. <laughs> so th thank you for your testimony. This is really helping to um, understand the situation fully because I think we had a lot of focus on the CP sector. And so I appreciate you coming and talking about the CVs. Um, now I lost my question. <laughs> 
We'll see if we have any other yeah, questions. Exactly. Oh, Chelsea and then Annika. Thank you through the chair. I remembered my other one. Can you just talk about, um, so by requesting this change and, you know, asking for a separate discussion paper to potentially look at raising and both separating out the POP from the rest of the aggregated rockfish MRA, um, do you anticipate in a, a change in behavior? Do you, are your vessel, are the vessels actively trying to avoid POP already. So I guess, could you talk about the incentives to target or avoid? <laughs> so um, I, through the chair, thank you for the question, Chelsea. I mean, I think, um, and we went into quite detail on this issue in our comment letter for the proposed rule for EM, but if you really think about Pollock and POP, one's spiny and one's not. So if you mix them together, what do you got? You got a, a, a mess. So you don't want to target both of them at the same time. Typically, you're not, your, your value in terms of what you're catching is a lot, you know, you want Pollock because you're going to get a better price than you're going to get for the POP. So vessels definitely actively try to avoid the POP. Thank you. Annika. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Julie, for your testimony. Um, so I, I heard you make a request to change a specific percentage in an MRA table, and I heard another request from Mr. C to do the same thing for a different species. Um, so the discussion paper that we have in front of us is pretty focused on MRA methodology. So would you be willing, I just want to confirm that you're willing to have this percentage request looked at in a action that's separate from what we currently are looking at right now. Through the chair, um, Annika, I would prefer it be in this package, but if that's where the direction this is going, where we're having two separate packages, I guess I have to live with that, even though it wasn't, because it's just such a, what flagrant misspecification for incidental catch for that particular species. So, and uh, I, uh, the other path is going to take a lot longer, I think. Thank you. Lauren. Now I have my question and another. So is based on what you just said, kind of, is there a current um, regulatory action process or review process where we look at MRAs and determine if these are still relevant? Or is this something where you have to come species by species as it seems necessary to change? I don't know if that's a question for you or for, you know, staff. So, so uh, through the chair, uh, since I've been doing this for uh, 30 years, I guess, 20 years at the council, typically they just stick with the MRA table 10 and 11 um, and you don't really go back and revisit them unless there's an issue. So I do know that the MRAs in the Gulf of Alaska was changed for skates because there was um, problems exceeding the ABC. So when issues like that arise and uh, they changed the sablefish MRAs way back in the 1990s because because of uh, um, with the catcher vessel or the trawlers were exceeding their apportionment of the sable fish. But it's so case by case. Thank you, um, and I appreciate all the knowledge that you bring to this table <laughs> regularly. And then, um, if you can maybe just and this is also just you know an on vessel question, so maybe also not relevant, but just to understand as well, like I imagine you'd have to estimate. Currently, you'd have to estimate your discards, and that would be logged toe by toe. Or how does how does that work currently in terms of how the discarding is calculated? So uh, Patty could answer that question better than me. But yeah, you have to estimate your discards toe by toe. Or it doesn't. It's not toe by toe. It's on, on the but by, by the trip, day by day. Okay. See. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Up next, we have Todd Loomis and Glenn Merrill. Welcome, gentlemen. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the AP, Todd Loomis uh, with Glenn Merrill on behalf of Groundfish Forum. So first, I wanted to thank the, the agency for the work and the, the back and forth on this topic. Um, I think they did a, a great job outlining uh, the, the many things that kind of need clarification in the regulations um, and a, a potential pathway forward uh, to consider. And I think they also did a great job outlining the industry proposal. So I would encourage the AP to move this issue forward um, and let's get an initial review analysis that would address a lot of these questions and I think really dig into these issues. So this is a topic that I've, I've been, I don't know how many years I've been doing this, but I've answered more trip trigger and MRA questions over the years than I can count. And this industry proposal grew out of my own frustration with having the same discussions year after year. And I have pages of notes from discussions with enforcement in the early years of my career, just trying to figure out, okay, this is what the regs say. What does it actually mean? And, and then as we've progressed through, you know, partial observer coverage to full observer coverage to two observers on every boat to VMS through our different programs, we have incredibly fine information um, that I don't believe is being utilized. We have a system that has parts of the regulations that are 30 years old and they have not kept up with modern times. And I think it leads to inefficiency. So this industry proposal, the idea formulated maybe two years ago, and I started talking to different sectors. I started talking to council members about you know, do you have the same issues trying to understand what you're supposed to do? And do you have regulatory discards? And the answer was yes. And so I put this proposal forward at the October meeting last year to try and simplify the system so people could actually read the regulations and understand what you're supposed to do. And one way to do that is to simplify the trip triggers. Fishing on a Friday shouldn't be any different than fishing on a Sunday in terms of what you can retain. And having all these trip triggers just leads to regulatory discards. These are fish that are caught, that are killed, and you should have the ability to retain them under the system if the MRA would allow it. And then I think the other thing is uh, changing from more species from an instantaneous calculation to a calculation at offload because that it makes sense. You're just because you're two tons over or, you know, some small percentage over on a Monday by a Wednesday, you're going to be so far under the MRA. Why did I have to discard that fish? Every sector gets beat up for having discards and we should make some positive changes to eliminate that. The, um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on, you know, I mentioned uh, communications with other sectors, and I think we had, uh, unlike many actions in front of the the AP, um, we do have many sectors that support looking at this issue. NPFA su submitted a letter, Chad C., our friends in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, I think everybody stands to benefit under this type of a proposal, and we should see it through, get some more information and see what it tells us. And I'll see if Mr. Merrill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Loomis. I think the one thing I did want to highlight is building on what Mr. Loomis was mentioning in terms of reducing regulatory discards. This council earlier in this meeting struggled with trying to address a, an important issue with, with bycatch and how we want to manage this. Yeah. Bycatch can occur due to regulatory actions that are in place. And I think what this action is seeking to do with broad industry support is try and find a way to greatly simplify our regulations. I think this is also consistent with two other things that I'd like to highlight, NOAA's seafood strategy, as well as some of the recommendations that came from the Alaska Bycatch Task Force. I think those are also important things that we can think of moving forward. And also with your indulgence, uh, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to just take a moment to say this is Mr. Loomis's last meeting. Uh, Mr. Loomis will be retiring, and I think he's managed to do something that's pretty remarkable in this process, which is pretty much be respected by almost everybody. 
And I will personally miss him a great deal. And I appreciate the many years of working with him. Thank you. Uh, does the AP have any questions? Heather and then Chelsea. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, as Brian noted. <laughs> like uh, um, well, you took away my first question, which was going to be, is this the last time that you're going to testify in front of this body? Um, but my other question related to the topic is around um, the previous testifier and where your level of support stands for addressing the POP issue in this package or separately. Uh, th thank you. Through the chair, the whole idea behind this package is to reduce, simplify and reduce regulatory discards. So I think that to the, to the, uh, um, extent that an MRA is insufficient and it's causing regulatory discards, I think it's appropriate to look at it. Now, when you go to that MRA table and want to start changing percentages, I think that's, you know, slightly more complex and it depends on how many species you're talking about. And if I think it could fit in this package, but I think it also, you know, if it gets too complex, it could bog this package down and I'd prefer it be on a separate track then. And, Thanks, and thanks for all of your work. Kelsey, you had a question, right? Well, it's not a question, but I also just wanted to go on the record. Glenn took my thunder and say thank you for all that you did, and and also just how you welcome new AP members and people to the process and treat everyone with respect and your, your knowledge. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Annika. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr. Loomis and Mr. Merrill. It's the Todd and Glenn show. Um, Mr. Loomis, I wanted to take uh, this opportunity to kind of pick your brain a little bit since this is the last time you'll be testifying in front of the AP and you have a large amount of historical knowledge. Um, my, my question is specific to something that was brought up in the Groundfish Forum comment letter um, regarding the enforcement of closed areas. Um, I was hoping you could my understanding is this is an issue that exists outside of the proposed action alternatives. And I, I was in the presentation, we heard that, that that had been looked at maybe before in other regulatory packages. So I just, I just wanted to kind of help, help me understand a little bit more about how you see that potential issue. Uh, thank you for the question through the chair. So, so I think a lot of the, the enforceability um, of something like an MRA, you know, it's so dependent on the definitions of, you know, what is a fishing trip, um, the directed fishing definition, all the, all of these things are interwoven. And there's been numerous actions that have looked at a microscopic level, um, the stellar sea lion actions over the years, I mean, really bore into fishing behavior and directed fishing versus individual toes. And I think it, in my opinion, it's more of a policy decision. So for example, when Pollock went to offload to offload, it allowed for people to be over the MRA. And, you know, some would say, well, they're directed fishing if they're over the MRA, but it was an acknowledgement of Pollock are intermixed with almost every fishery. And there's instances where you're going to be over the MRA, even if you're not trying to catch Pollock. And it's short-sighted to have to discard that fish that you've caught and killed anyway. So I think moving to a system where, um, you know, in its simplest form, managing all MRAs at offload, there's nothing simpler to enforce then that calculation. It's one calculation. You don't have to worry about all these different trip triggers. You just add up everything that was open throughout the trip that was retained. That's your base of species, focusing in on when and where a species is open to directed fishing. And everything else, you're either over the MRA percentage or you're under it. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And that's the goal of this package. Keep it simple, make it more enforceable. And whether you agree with the policy call 
you know, I, I don't view that as being enforcement's role. Their role is to enforce the policies put in place by the council. It's not a follow-up, it's a second question. <laughs> um, and it's also related to something that's in the letter that was submitted. Um, so the current regulation states that the lowest MRA is applicable for the duration of the fishing trip. And that, that my understanding from the discussion with staff and is that that may be appropriate for catcher vessels, but may not be appropriate for CPs and motherships. Can you expand on that for me? Through the chair, I, I agree that it's not appropriate for catcher processors and motherships. And I think that's the, that's what killed the prior action um, where they looked at making this offload to offload. Um, I think the idea is that vessels move around a lot. You have mixed species fisheries and you may not be trying to catch the incidental species, but you do. And we ought to provide as much opportunity as possible to retain those species as long as you're not creating a, you know, a, a biological issue. It's, you know, too much catch where you're exceeding, um, you know, the specifications or creating a problem for another sector. Um, catching fish and retaining fish, even if it's an incidental species, is not bad. And we should allow it to the extent that it's not creating problems. Normally, uh, we wouldn't allow a third question, but seeing as this is Mr. Loomis's last last time, we'll, we'll give it to you. It's not a question. It's a comment. I just wanted to say that I personally appreciate everything, um, all the you have taught me a great many things uh, about this process and about the way that regulations apply to the Amendment 80 sector. And so thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question online now from Julie Cavanaugh. Julie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Brian, through the chair. Thank you, Todd and Glenn. Um, uh, you, in, in the context of trying to reduce discards and bycatch, <clears throat> could you give me your thoughts or comments on whether how it may be or may be helpful or, be, or maybe it's a, not a possibility for other reasons if you, that if you have tack or allocation <clears throat> available in a species, would you, would it be helpful or a hindrance to be able to utilize that um, when you have like a mixed catch situation? And I can clarify if that doesn't make sense. Sure, thank you. Uh, why don't I'll, I'll start and I'm sure Mr. Loomis has some thoughts on this as well. So I, I think a good example of how this can unfold and, and protect, perhaps reduce regulatory discards is you start a trip, you run into some species that's not a target species, it's on an MRA. You encounter that and you are required as a catcher processor to be uh, subject to an instantaneous calculation of that MRA amount. You discard what you have and you discard almost all of that because at the time that that incident occurred, you had almost no basis species on board your vessel. Later on in the trip, you get more basis species. And if you had been able to retain that amount that you had caught early on, you would have been able to find value for that. Instead, you had to discard it. The same amount of mortality has occurred. The fish are dead either way. But in that calculation methodology using an instantaneous calculation methodology, all of those fish go overboard and they have no value. It still comes off of your quota. It's still a calculation that occurs, but you're not able to retain it. Julie, does that answer your question? Um, it's definitely um, a clarifying answer for other reasons, but I, so maybe an ex a quick example. <clears throat> if you are directed fishing for um, a species, I don't know, pollock or something, and you, you're you under an, an MRA, an incidental catch situation for cod, but <clears throat> you have directed cod fishing quota available, right now you're not able to keep, retain all that cod and account for it under your allocation. Would a situation where you could do that, would that be helpful? 
Thank you, Julie. So uh, it, currently, we are subject to the same directed fishing closures. And for example, the Bering Sea, when the Bering Sea cod um, ITAC is being approached, they close down directed fishing to all sectors, even though Amendment 80 has its own cod quota, cod is closed to us. So for example, if you went out, started a trip and your very first haul ended up being 22% cod, you would have to discard cod um, from that first haul because you're over the MRA and it's instantaneous. The 22%, every cod you caught counted against your quota and by the end of the trip, your total amount of cod on board is probably closer to 5 to 10%. So the instantaneous drove a discard that still counted against your quota. It was dead cod. Why did you have to discard it? That's kind of the one of the main things we're trying to address in this package in a variety of fisheries. The same thing can happen in IFQ when they catch cod early in a trip. Julie, okay. does that help? It helps a little bit, but maybe I'll just get offline with um, you or Chelsea whenever it's possible, because that it's kind of along the lines, but I think I could take up too much time today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Paul now. To the chair, thank you for, for your testimony today. Um, just wanted to um, sort of dig in a little bit more with uh, with with your example there, Todd. You were talking essentially about sort of what some people term as a lightning strike event, or is it is sort of an excess amount of non-target species that that sort of shows up, and you, by regulation now in instantaneous MRAs, you have to discard um, potentially all of that, um, most of it. Um, what um, what then would occur on the next fall or couple of days in order to Sort of bring your percentages back down to that five percent. Is that? It seems like with the with the sort of to use an example that we used earlier this week, the pollock fishery and the ICAs um, or the IPAs rather. The the vessel, if there's a lightning strike of of some salmon, the vessel will move out of the way and go to a different spot in order to try and sort of find areas with with lower abundances of of salmon, for example. So I'm wondering sort of how that type of behavior um, sort of works with the with the, the fisheries that you're talking about. Thank you through the chair. I think it's ve very similar probably with all sectors. You, you go out, you start a trip, maybe where you were fishing last trip and the fishing was clean and good and you do your first haul and you're like, ooh, things have changed, you know, different species composition. And in my example, you know, maybe more cod than you wanted over the MRA. So the boat would move. You'd, you know, start moving around the Bering Sea to try to find that clean fishing so you could get back on your, your primary flatfish target. And it, it also raises, an, um, you know, something I was thinking about when Krista was testifying about the, you know, the MRA percentages are, they're pretty conservative in my opinion, because if you're to end up in a directed fishing target, all you have to do is be over the MRA. So if you're 22% cod, it's it's not like you're really targeting cod. You're just over a, a pretty low number to begin with. Okay, thank, thank you. That makes sense. I do have one additional question, which is quite rare for me. Um, uh, Glenn, you mentioned uh, that this... this uh, um, Changing MRAs would be sort of in line with the some of the the recommendations of the Alaska Bytech, Bycatch Task Force, which is a sort of a public process with a lot of input from from folks and, and industry members to try and sort of get at the the sort of the nuance of of the problem with bycatch. And so I was wondering if you could sort of expound on that a little bit more than sort of your comment earlier and what's in your letter. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Paul. I think to expand on that a little bit. In situations where early in a trip in particular, you encounter a species that's an MRA species, now you have to discard it. I think this proposed changes, looking at this in particular, going from offload to offload, which we already do for two species. We already have that for Pollock, and we also have that for Bering Sea uh, 
acromacral as well. So it'd be aligning those so that what can happen in that trip is that occurs, that event occurs, you can retain it rather than throwing it overboard. I think that's the easiest kind of example of how this could improve it. I think also just simplifying the regulations themselves to make it a lot clear, clearer for crew when they're on board a vessel about how these MRAs apply can also simplify and I think reduce regulatory discards. Right now, these MRA regulations are very complicated. Our company, and I suspect other companies, have a methodology in place to try and assist the crew, the pursers, everyone in the factory to understand how you should comply with the MRA requirements. Sometimes in that process, folks are operating in a more cautious manner and they discard more simply because they're concerned about potentially violating one of the multiple triggers for a fishing trip or changes in basis species or all of the other factors that can affect what an MRA calculation is. So I think also there's a, another aspect of this as well that will likely come out in the analysis, and that is simplification of regulation can improve retention. Thank you for the response. Julie, is that a legacy hand or do you have another question? It's a legacy hand, I apologize. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Loomis, thank you for all your work. Uh, that concludes public testimony on D2, MRA, adju or MRA adjustments. Um, with that, I'd like to take a mid-morning break. We'll come back and see if the AP has any motions on this. Let's reconvene at 10.20.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, if members of the AP could find their seats, not singling anyone out, Landry. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, we'll see if we have uh, any motions for D2 MRA adjustments. Annika, go ahead, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. Right. The AP recommends the council move the maximum retainable amounts MRA discussion paper forward as an initial review analysis. For the analysis, the council should consider a purpose and need statement that incorporates the following points. MRA regulations have been developed ad hoc over multiple decades. Current MRA regulations need to be updated for improved clarity and reduced complexity. Modifying existing MRA trip triggers and accounting will lead to a reduction of unnecessary and wasteful regulatory discards. The council should consider the following alternatives for analysis. Alternatives two, three, and four are not mutually exclusive. Under any of the alternatives, the intention for catcher processors and motherships is that when and where a species is open to directed fishing, that vessels be able to retain all catch and when and where a species is closed to directed fishing, they be bound by the MRA. The intention is not for the lowest MRA encountered to apply for the duration of the trip. Alternative one, no, actus, no action status quo. Alternative two, revise the triggers that end a fishing trip from five to two triggers in the definition of a fishing trip for catcher processors and motherships. Two triggers would remain. One, when all fish or fish product is offloaded, and two, if the vessel changes authorized gear type. Alternative three, add additional species to an offload to offload MRA application in the BSAI and GOA for all vessel sectors. Option one, add BSAI Pacific Cod, GOA Pacific Cod, GOA Pollock, GOA shallow water flatfish, parentheses, increased retention, increased utilization, IRIU species, BSAI, BSAI skates, GOA skates, and CGOA rockfish program. Option two, include all groundfish species. Alternative four, provide exemptions and regulation from MRA requirements in cases of medical emergencies, mechanical emergencies, or poor weather that ends a fishing trip. Triggers that should be considered for MRA regulatory exemption include US Coast Guard Form 2692, the bridge logbook, or catcher vessel daily fishing log DFL. The AP recommends that the analysis include all suggested regulatory language revisions identified by NIMS. Thanks, Susie. MRI regulations are important as they allow for retention of unavoidable incidental catch in other target fisheries, thereby allowing for increased utilization where a directed fishery is not possible. However, these regulations have developed and evolved over multiple decades, creating a patchwork of rules and requirements that lead to confusion and unnecessary waste. Updating the MRA regulations is needed to improve clarity, reduce complexity, and reduce regulatory discards. The motion separates each discrete change into an alternative. Alternative two revises the fishing trip definition for CPs and motherships, changing it from a definition with five separate triggers to a definition with two triggers. This would simplify an extremely complex regulatory definition of fishing trip into a current common English language understanding of a fishing trip. That is a fishing trip begins when the vessel begins harvesting or receiving ground fish and ends when the product is offloaded. Revising this trip trigger definition will make tracking and calculating MRAs easier and less confusing for the fishing fleet. It will also decrease regulatory discards that occur when vessels are forced into complex matrices of MRA accounting for multiple concurrent regulatory fishing trips as described in the discussion paper. There is no conservation benefit to multiple concurrent regulatory fishing trips. In addition, management and enforcement of MRAs will likely be easier if there were less fishing trips to unwind accounting streams for. Note that in this alternative, separate management programs, for example, Amendment 80, CDQ, open access TLAS, would continue to be separate fishing trips with separate MRA data streams. Alternative three contemplates changes to MRA accounting by moving an additional group of species from the category of instantaneous MRA calculations into the category of offload to offload MRA calculations. There is a precedent for this type of management. 
Currently, BSAI Pollock and Bering Sea ACK and mackerel MRAs are calculated offload to offload. Option one suggests adding a discrete list of species to offload to offload calculations, including the remaining IRIU species to the list. The intent of IRIU regulations is to minimize discarding of these species, and this change will result in exactly that, less discarding of these species. The addition of BSAI and GOA skates are responsive to public comment on this issue. Option two suggests analyzing a change to the MRA accounting for all ground fish species in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska. Overall, the rationale for analyzing alternative three is to move away from a system of daily regulatory discards that occur as a result of a vessel needing to comply with instantaneous MRAs throughout a fishing trip. Vessels constantly monitor the total catch of basis, basis species for the fishing trip and discard incidental species to ensure they are never over the MRA at any point in time. It is anticipated that moving away from this system will reduce regulatory discards without changing vessel behavior and increasing levels of incidental catch. Basically, a fish will just not have to be thrown overboard just because it was caught at the wrong time of day or on the wrong day. However, my expectation is that an analysis will examine any potential changes in behavior from either of the options in alternative three. Alternative four is responsive to public comment and suggests exemptions from MRA requirements in the case of circumstances that are out of the vessel's control, including medical emergencies, mechanical emergencies, and poor weather conditions. U.S. Coast Guard Form 2692 must be completed if there is a serious medical issue or marine casualty. The bridge logbook or the catcher vessel daily fishing log, DFL, are used to record an issue that causes a vessel to return to port early that isn't captured in a 2692. Examples of this would be a deck hydraulic failure, VMS failure, broken flow scale, or weather conditions that threaten safety at sea. Using these formal documents, it would then be up to NIMS OLE's discretion whether to grant the exemption. There may be other ways for the mechanics of these exemptions to work, and I would expect that this could be fleshed out in the analysis. Finally, revising and updating regulatory text as identified by NIMS in the analysis is necessary to reflect current practices and to avoid continued confusion on how MRA calculations should be done. The intent of the last sentence in the motion is to have all of NIMS's proposed clarifications contained and analyzed in the document. There's broad support from multiple different fishing sectors in both the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska for moving this to initial review, which is indicative of the overarching positive benefits this action will have. The positive changes anticipated from this action fit under one of the goals of NOAA's National Seafood Strategy to maintain or increase sustainable U.S. wild capture production. They also align with the Alaska Bycatch Task, For Task Force's recommendation where the state of Alaska should support taking incremental measures through the regulatory process to improve bycatch utilization, with a particular focus on species that are otherwise marketable but are caught with non-targeted gear or discards in a directed fishery that are required by regulation. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you for the motion, Annika. Lauren, go ahead, please. Thank you so much for the motion. Um, this might just be a question for staff, but we often hear it's important to be specific if we want to see certain data analyzed in the document. So I'm just wondering if there were certain points like changes in potential fishing behavior or potential changes in fishing behavior, does that need to be stated as something to look at specifically, or is that just inherently going to get flushed out in the document like it was you know, spoken by it? Um, through the chair. Thanks for that question. Um, I think if you want to clarify that that's something that AP would like to see flushed out in the analysis, then certainly include that in your motion. But I also think that naturally when this goes into an analysis, that that's something that will probably just naturally come up through, you know, through the analysis. Slightly conflicting right <laughs> direction. <laughs> I guess I would suggest if the AP is interested in looking at that, that you put it in the motion. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> That's probably the easiest way to do it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question 
Oh, do you have a response? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Krista. I guess I spoke to it in my rationale specifically, I think to highlight it as the maker of the motion that that was something that I wanted to be contained. And so I'm not quite sure on process, but is that sufficient if it's captured in the rationale? Um, is that sufficient to make sure that it's something like that is analyzed in an initial review? Through the chair, I think it is, yes. Um, okay, do we have any other questions? Oh, we have a question online, sorry. Julie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Brian, through the chair. Thank you, Annika, for your um, motion. I think it's, it's um, well-written and I was just looking at the first three bullet points that should be included in the purpose and need statement. I was just wondering if um, you would consider a friendly amendment under the third bullet where it says will lead to a reduction. Um, maybe the uh, for me, a more comfortable word other than will would be should, um, just because will kind of, um, it just implies that any modification would lead to a reduction and the word should seems like it would cover what maybe the intention that you had was? Through the chair, Julie, thanks for the question. Um, I understand that the AP is trying to get away from friendly amendments. Um, oh, okay. I, Thank you. But I, I guess my response to that is is the reason, let me back up. The reason that I kind of structured this is not a formal purpose and need, um, but as a sort of bullet list um, for the AP to potentially send over to the council is because I think these are just points that the AP wants to highlight for the council and quite they can put together a purpose and need as as they fit for this action if, if they decide to move forward with it. Um, and then I think the second thing is that in, I guess, in my view, uh, the entire purpose of kind of going forward with this package is that it will lead to regulatory discards. Um, and I think that that's borne out in the discussion paper. Um, and so I'd, I'd prefer that the verbiage stay the same. That's, I guess, my response. Okay, thank you for that. And I um, appreciate the not wanting a friendly amendment. Maybe we should, um formally state that because it does sometimes put the maker of the motion under a lot of uh, pressure to accept something they don't want. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. Other questions? Paul. the chair thank you Annika for the for the motion um I just wanted to clarify under alternative four you have a list of several things that is clearly not meant to be exhaustive but I was wondering if um you could possibly identify what you mean by bridge logbook and maybe specifically why uh the DCPL was not included sorry do I, do I should I repeat Maybe okay. fire away one more time. Sorry. Testing, is this better? Sorry. Uh, uh, according to alternative four, there um, would be particular um, triggers that uh, um, create uh, an exemption from from the uh, MRAs. And uh, there's a list, uh, including the Coast Guard Form 2692, the um, catcher vessel daily fishing log, as well as the bridge log book. And I was wondering if you could... Um, elaborate on bridge logbook and um, maybe a, a comment or two why um, the catcher processor logbook was not included. Thank you. Through the chair, thanks for the question, Paul. Um, I think my, in, my intent with the choices that are in this alternative is I guess the 2692 is required under regulation 
for marine casualties. And so that kind of deals with sort of the bigger issues that may arise when a vessel's at sea. Um, I think the other two choices, the bridge logbook and then the catcher vessel daily fishing logbook, I think my intent was to be responsive to the fact that different types of vessels record non-2692 issues in, in different ways. Um, and so my intent was to include something, a document that catcher processors might use to document those kind of issues. Um, and then a way that catcher vessels might document those kind of issues. Um, so I guess that was, that's why I chose those three things to start with. That clarifies it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Julie, is that a residual hand? Yep. Are there any amendments? Comments? Chelsea. Thank you through the chair. Uh, thank you, Annika, for the motion and the very well thought out rationale. Um, I really appreciate you bringing this forward, it, forward since I too spend a lot of time with MRA confusion um, and including the distinction between IRU and MRA. Um, and I think the, the biggest confusion that's not found in the regulations always happens to occur on the weekends or late at night. <laughs> and so that's this really helps uh, clarify a lot of things and I'm glad you brought it forward. Um, I also just wanted to briefly highlight for the record a specific instance where an exemption for an injury would apply and, and how this would be beneficial. Um, so last fall, I got a call from a vessel late in the evening and they had set a test tow for Pollock. And when they hauled back, uh, the majority of that tow ended up being P OP, and so they had a higher percentage. And during the haulback, a crew member smashed their hand on the doors, and so they had a severe injury. And the crew still <laughs> called me and still um, was concerned about whether he had to try to discard the 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 POP to not be in excess of the MRA. And so really clearly spelling that out in regulations would definitely provide, you know, it enhances safety at sea and having a clear process, um, especially when you can't necessarily get a, get a hold of enforcement um, spelled out in the regulations is really important so that vessels can focus on safety rather than, um, you know, discarding POP. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Uh, let's go tomorrow online and then Heather and then Lauren. Hi, thank you through the chair. I just wanted to thank Annika for all her work on this. She has been responsive to multiple sectors and collaborative throughout the process. I agree with her rationale and think it has potential to be very beneficial to multiple sectors and I support it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for the motion. I'll align myself with tomorrow's comments and also um, add that, you know, this has been a long time issue and Mr. Loomis has been working on it for quite some time, um, doing all the due diligence that needed to be done. And so I think it's appropriate um, at this point uh, to move it forward. So I'll support the motion. Thank you. Lauren. Yeah, and thank you, Annika, for, for this motion. Um, I will be supportive and I look forward to further discussions. Um, I do believe that's important to discourage discarding. And I also think there was some um, topic or some conversation we had at, off the table about how the data will be better in terms of spatiotemporal distribution of fish rather than estimated discards and what that looks like. So I think all in all, it is important to have um, better accountability of, of the fish that's being caught by a vessel. Um, I do have a little, a few concerns about the way that this could incentivize incidental catch and maybe some changes in fishing behavior. But as we spoke to this um, ideally will be talked about in the further analysis and we can discuss it further. And I look forward to hearing uh, more information about that as we move forward. Um, and I think I will stop with that. And I, I get it. There's a lot of honors calculations and there's a lot of difficulty and we all want to see, you know, decrease in bycatch, increase in utilization and, and in general, just better fishing practices. So again, thank you. Thank you, Julie. And then Susie. 
Yeah, thank you, Annika, for your motion. Um, I will be supporting it, but I will align my uh, self with Lauren's um, comments um, with her the concerns she has. And then I'm also uh, a little bit concerned about the way the third bullet is worded. I think there was conversation where um, it was unclear whether some of the things listed would re would lead to a reduction or um, could potentially increase that. So um, even though I'm going to support it, I have those those set couple concerns. But I also recognize that. Um, many of the regulatory changes would be very helpful and, and reduce the um, complexity of, re of that. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Susie. Through the chair. Thanks, Annika. I'm going to align myself with the supportive comments prior. Um, I really appreciate all the collaboration among sectors and fisheries. I think this is a really um, kind of holistic approach here. Um, I also just, I, I really appreciate the looking at trying to bring some of our regulatory language and regulations into more uh, current standards and what we're dealing with now. I know a lot of a lot of regulations we deal with in a lot of these different agenda items. Um, it comes up pretty often that we we made that regulation 30 years ago before I was born. And so I'm always like, all right, well, let's do something about it. So I really appreciate that you all, that have, everybody that's worked on this has been able to really assess and develop something and bring it into this um, more updated space. So thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, would those in support of Annika's motion please raise their hands? That motion passes 20 to zero. Do we have any other motions? Chelsea, go ahead, please. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, the AP recommends that the council initiate a discussion paper to explore the potential of increasing the following existing MRA percentage. The MRA percentage for Goa aggregated rockfish, specifically Pacific Ocean perch, as the incidental catch species, and Pollock as the basis species in Table 10 to Part 679. The discuss discussion paper should include, but is not limited to the following, a history of the implementation of the MRA percentages, including POP stock status at the time of implementation of the MRA, information on the current GOA POP stock assessment, oh, <laughs> somebody can make her friendly, considerations for whether POP should have a separate MRA from the aggregated rockfish MRA in the GOA Pollock target. And with a second, I will speak to my rationale. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm going to try to be brief, but I wanted to make sure that I fully explain a lot of the rationale. Some of this came up in testimony, which was awesome. Um, but I'm going to begin with a brief MR overview of just how MRAs currently function for our vessels, since we have both EM and non-EM vessels in the Gulf Pollock fleet, and provide a little bit of historical context on the MRA and rockfish retention requirements. Uh, when EM vessels fish an EM trip, they are exempt from the MRA regulations and are required to retain all rockfish, including POP, as part of the EM maximum retention requirement. They deliver it to the plant, and at the end of the season, they are assessed performance for each trip under the 5% MRA, according to our NIMS-approved performance standard in the EFP, which will become an IPA in the regulated program in 2025, barring any changes between the proposed rule and final rule. They are required to forfeit the value of all MRA overages greater than $250, just like the MRA regulation enforcement. Fines are assessed according to the fine schedule, and vessels must pay invoices prior to the next season. This is to ensure that their behavior doesn't change to start targeting more rockfish. Essentially, even though they are exempt from the MRA in regulatory form, they must still comply with the intention of the MRA via the IPA. When vessels fish a non-EM trip, they may retain, but are not required to, rockfish up to the 5% MRA percentage. All other rockfish are discarded. As we know, they experience barotrauma due to the pressure change, and all are dead. More than half of the Gulf Pollock fleet also participate in the Central Gulf Rockfish Program, belonging to one and belong to one of the five rockfish 
cooperatives, so they are allocated POP, Northern Rockfish, and Dusky Rockfish on LLPs. However, even though they may have POP quota, they are not allowed to use it when directed fishing for pollock. Instead, all trawl caught POP catch outside of the rockfish program accrues to the POP incidental catch allowance, which we heard mentioned in public testimony, which is annually specified each year and is currently set at 3,500 metric tons for 2024, uh, which is a fi 500 metric ton increase from 2023 and a 1,000 metric ton increase from 2022. When NIMS sets the specifications each year, the I ICA comes off of the Central Gulf POP TAC before allocating POP to the Rockfish program. In other words, incidental catch of POP affects how much POP ultimately gets allocated to the same vessels in the Rockfish program, as well as other vessels in the CP sector, which is just one of many incentives to not target POP in the Pollock fishery. Because if we use a lot of TAC, based on vessel behavior, the agency will raise the limit the following year. While the aggregated rockfish MRA has remained 5% in the Pollock target since 1995, retention requirements have changed for other sectors. In April 2019, the council took final action to require full retention of all rockfish species for fixed gear vessels, uh, fixed gear catcher vessels in the Bering Sea and Gulf. The council's purpose and need for that action stated, Fixed gear CVs in the Bering Sea and Gulf discard a proportion of their incidental catch of rockfish. The greatest amount of discarded rockfish occurs in the Gulf hook and line fisheries. Requiring the full retention of rockfish would improve identification of species catch composition when CVs are subject to EM, improve data collection by providing more accurate assessments of total catch, reduce incentives to discard rockfish, may reduce waste, reduce overall enforcement burden, and provide more consistency in regulations. Despite this regulatory change for the fixed gear sector, the trawl gear sector remains subject to the 5% MRA and the social associated penalties, regardless if they were required to keep it all under EM. When the MRA tables were put into place for the Gulf in 1995, the POP stock was overfish and under a rebuilding plan. A September 1993 council memorandum reviewing the rebuilding plan for POP in the Gulf stated that the current spawning biomass at that time was 70,800 metric tons, or less than half and less than half of the desired target level of 150,000 metric tons. We are now far beyond that successful rebuilding plan for POP. Page two of the 2023 GOA POP safe document states, for the 2024 fishery, we recommend the maximum allowable ABC of 39,719 tons. This ABC is a 9.7% increase from the ABC recommended by last year's model for 2024. The increase is attributed to the fact that the model has observed six consecutive survey biomass estimates larger than 1 million tons as well as an increase in survey biomass in 2023 compared to 2021. I should also note that the ABC is set well below the overfishing level of 43,117 tons. The Pollock fleet is seeing and drastically feeling the pressure of this increase in biomass on the grounds. Complicating the issue is also the abundance of Pollock and the way they are now moving and schooling together. The two species are virtually identical on a net sounder, making it more difficult to avoid. Two vessels can and have set right near next to each other on the same sign, and one can catch a bag of pollock and one can catch a, a bag of POP. I want to be clear that vessels do not want to bring in POP with their pollock trip, and their processors do not want it either. Vessels do not get paid for it, and if they do, it's a few cents compared to the price that they would receive in the rockfish program. Pollock trips mixed with POP affect the pollock quality and take a space in the fish hold that could have been filled by the pollock they will get paid for. One operator with a bad accidental POP tow last year noted to me that the trip cost him about $70,000 in lost product value since he had min minimal pollock, fines, fuel costs to come in light, and lost additional fishing time because to offload and sort out a high volume of POP is a lot slower than a typical pollock offload.
There is literally no incentive to target POP or any rockfish incidentally, but yet it's becoming a problem that is nearly impossible to avoid in early A season and then most of the fall B season. And when the fleet is targeting POP in the rockfish program, it's becoming nearly impossible to avoid pollock. However, the 20% pollock MRA when checked into the rockfish program provides more of a buffer from financial penalty and but it's still operationally difficult since POP is what the vessels and processors want at that time. We're not in I'm not intentionally specifying a particular MRA to be examined, but we would prefer a 20% MRA to keep it more in line with existing MRAs. To summarize, since the aggregated rockfish or POP MRA was put into place, the stock has moved from overfished and the survey spawning biomass is now over a million tons. Further, ex exploring this in a discussion paper does not mean that the council would necessarily move to analysis, although we do think it's warranted. And it will not change the uh, amount of rockfish removals. Vessels will still be trying to avoid it since it prevents so many oper or presents so many operational cha challenges. This discussion paper, if pursued to an action, would only help provide better data since all catch would be weighted at the dock instead of being just a discard estimate, provide a larger buffer of what could possibly be utilized, and a wider buffer of release from MRA fines since the ecosystem and POP biomass has changed so significantly. It also should also be noted that this would meet the Alaska Bycatch Task Force recommendation that the state of Alaska should support taking incremental measures through the rec regulatory process to improve bycatch utilization with a particular focus on species that are otherwise marketable but are caught with non-targeted gear or discards in a directed fishery they, that are required by regulation. I know this is a complicated issue and it's been a long week, so thank you for listening. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Tamara, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you through the chair. Thank you, Chelsea, for this motion. I wanted to ask you how you would feel about adding a fourth bullet point to explore the likely effects of an increase, an increase might have on the harvest of the stocks and regulatory discards in your discussion paper list. Yes, sure, I would be open to that adding that bullet. Um, I think that the discussion paper would include that, but yeah, we can, we can specify that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Julie, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chelsea, for your motion. Um, can you on a high level, if possible, explain to people that aren't familiar with, um, MRAs and, and setting those percentages, what happens when, when or if like POP goes down to a, a low abundance again, would you still, would, do you remain at that 20% unless it's addressed in this type of fashion or is there some type of, I think it was said in um, public testimony that it's, it's kind of set in stone. Thank you through the chair. So yes, um, we would need to, to change that in the future. Um, but I would note that um, our stock assessments and our surveys indicate that POP seems to be one of the, the winners of, of climate change. And is just, so the populations are just continuing to explode. We also continue to have surveys. And when I say we, the biomass or the spawning biomass has been over a million tons in the Gulf for six consecutive surveys. That's not even six consecutive years. Um, I didn't take the time to look up how many years that was, but typically POP is assessed on the bottom trawl survey, which happens in the Gulf every other year. And there was also a pretty big gap during COVID from bottom trawl survey. So it's been a considerable amount of years. And I also think that's something that could be flushed out in the analysis. And obviously the SSC would, would really have the opportunity to weigh in um, to decide whether we were anywhere near approaching a status where we shouldn't make this change because there's instability in the stock. 
Yeah, thank you. And a follow up. Um, just that, is it, would it be, I mean, in my, my, my thought process, uh, the MRA percentage is set at like a worst case scenario. And from your rationale, it sounds like there's not really a, a, a at this point, a good reason to like, um, exploit that to the fullest because of the operational issues that you listed. So just because it was at 20%, if you have a lower biomass, you wouldn't necessarily reach that top cap because you wouldn't be encountering them as much. Yes, through the chair, that that would be correct. Um, I also think that, you know, we, even though our, our, my fleet's harvest of POP when they're in the Pollock target up to the MRA, um, they don't benefit from that because the processors don't want it. It damages their product. All of those reasons that I listed. Plus there's the incentive. We don't want to harm POP stocks because it's the rockfish program fishery is a really economically um, important part of Kodiak's business plan. So I think you know, we are really engaged in the process. And I think not only would things come out in the analysis, but I also think we would be responsive um, and we would not be trying to take more. This is really just an operational issue since the biomass has exploded so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Shannon, go ahead. Uh, to the chair, Brian. If appropriate, I, I just wanted to add a little bit to Chelsea's response from a one shoreside processor's standpoint, just along the lines of uh, us not wanting the product. I, I think Chelsea spoke to that well, but just a, a little bit more explanation. The very, the Gulf Pollock fishery is unrationalized. So we're trying to um, process Pollock as quickly as possible, get the boats back on, out on the grounds. POP requires a lot of uh, labor to, to process. It typically costs more. To, uh, to fillet it than it does for what the value of the fillet is. Um, and it's, like I said, incredibly labor intensive. It pulls people off the lines from processing the, the primary species of Pollock, puts them on a POP. Um, so it's very disruptive to the plant flow and efficiency. So it's not that we don't want the product. It's more just what it does to the, the, the fishery. So I, I think um, maybe in the future rationalization will help with that, but um, right now, that's sort of our perspective. We do um, certainly like POP when it's in the rationalized rockfish program because it comes in at a much slower pace, better quality. It is a quite fragile fish, too, to protect the, the color. So um, they're just trying to add a little bit of uh, credence to what Chelsea was saying in terms of us not wanting it, really discouraging the fleet from getting into it. I think what we have seen, though, is with the abundance, um, it's just hard to avoid um, so we're trying to also recognize that we want to minimize discards. Thank you, Lauren. I th thank you for this discourse. And I guess that kind of actually confused me a little bit because I thought the purpose of this was to increase the ability to maintain the product, but then you're stating that the processors don't want the product. So I'm, I'm struggling, I think with the um, disconnect of what the, I just heard. Okay. So I think it's both, but. So the one thing, the majority of our fleet is is fishing Pollock under EM. So it's being brought in anyway. So it's it's being brought in, it's being retained, and they're going to be subject to fines at a 5% MRA when the biomass is exploded. The other thing is, at least even in non-EM trips, even when processors aren't able to fillet it, um, the and you know, we we wish as as uh Shannon said, you know, we wish this were different, but at the very least Kodiak has a fish meal plant, which helps support. And so at least it has a use, even if it's not the most preferred use and it's coming in anyway. So it's kind of a, a twofer on that. And Shannon has more. <laughs> yeah. And I understand that that was a little confusing that uh, I should have prefaced what I was saying with what I was trying to speak to is just us. Uh, I, this isn't sort of designed to um, allow um harvesters to go target POP and, or incentivize them to uh, target POP. I think it's it's more about trying to minimize discards, but I'm trying to speak to why there would be a disincentive for fleet to go do that because uh, their processor would be upset. No, no, thank you for the explanation. And I'm grateful to hear that at least Kodiak has a fish meal plant because I think there's so much 
we can do with all the parts of the fish. I wish that more processors had that capacity. Any other questions? Amendments? Tamara, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you. I think Shannon has my amendment, so it should be coming up soon. Shannon, can you put uh, that in front of the MRA at the beginning as well to match number one? So I would like to add uh, number two, the MRA for BSAI skates, other species as the incidental catch species and the Pacific cod as the basis species in table 11 to part 679. And with a second, I'll talk to my rationale. Second. So this is in response to the testimony we heard and the written comments from the freezer longliners. The intent of considering an increase to the MRA percentage is to further minimize regulatory discards of skates by our fleet in the process, improve utilization of the resource. FLC members have been experiencing increased market demand for smaller skates in addition to the traditional market for larger skates. This creates the opportunity for our vessels to generate additional revenue from our targeted Bering Sea Pacific cod trips through increased retention of the encountered skates. We do not anticipate an increase in the MRA to affect fleet behavior on the harvested skates or an increase in overall skate catch. Rather, a change coupled with the revisions to the application of the MRA would facilitate greater retention of the skates we encounter. Um, it seems efficient to add this to Chelsea's motion to be looked at at the same time, and it seems to be consistent with the Alaska Bycatch Review Task Force to minimize regulatory discards. Thank you, Tamara. Do we have any questions regarding tomorrow's motion to amend? Tomorrow, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, are there any amendments? Comments? Chelsea, go ahead. I'm sorry, Brian, I had a, another amendment. You, yeah, we have to get through this amendment first, and you can't oh. amend your own amendment. Right, sorry. <laughs> it gets confusing online sometimes. It does. All right, it gets confusing sitting here, too. Um, Chelsea, go ahead. I just wanted to say that thank you, Tamara, for the amendment. Um, it was definitely responsive to public testimony, and so um, I will be supporting it. Thank you, Chelsea. Any other comments? Tomorrow, I'm not seeing any other comments with that. Uh, would those in support of the motion to amend, please raise their hands. That motion passes 20 to zero. Do we have any other amendments? Tomorrow, go ahead. Yes, I have a second amendment, which Shannon has, and I think she will be pulling it up soon. Is it Scott? Is that so? There will be a couple um, language changes to make the discussion paper list consistent with adding the number two 
So in the first bullet point, it will read a history of the implementation of the MRA percentages, including POP stock status at the timeline of the implementation of the two MRAs. The second bullet will read information on the current GOA props POP stock assessment in the GOA and the skate stock assessment in the BSAI. And then the fourth bullet point will um, say consideration of the likely effects on an increase in the MRA percentages on harvest of the stocks and regulatory discards. Then with a second, I can speak to that. Second. So the addition of the two MRAs and the skate stock in the BSAI is just to be consistent with adding the number two to the main motion. And the bullet point is just to be more prescriptive to the discussion paper to make sure that the um, harvest of stocks and regular discards are looked at appropriately. Thank you, Tamara. Are there any questions? Amendments? Comments? Would those in support of the motion to amend please raise their hands? That motion passes 19 to zero. With that, we return to the amended main motion. Are there any other amendments? Final comments. Annika, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Chelsea and Tamara for the motion. I'm gonna be supporting it. I think it brings out two kind of unique situations um, that we heard about in public comment. Um, and so I think it makes sense to initiate a discussion paper to be responsive to that comment. I just also want to note that I appreciate the phrasing of the discussion paper should include, but is not limited to the following. Um, I think that the issue of changing MRA percentages, there are likely other stakeholders um, in the North Pacific fisheries that may have other unique sets of circumstances with numbers specific numbers in the MRA tables that they may want to look at. And I understand that that's maybe not the intent of that particular part of this motion, but I just wanted to flag that um, as a potential, a potential outcome of a discussion paper that starts to look at specific unique issues with MRA table percentages. And so um, thank you for the motion. I think it's really well done and I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Annika. Any other comments? Seeing none, would those in support of the motion please raise their hands? That motion passes 19 to zero. Are there any other motions on D2? Seeing none, that brings us to our final agenda item for the day, staff tasking. I think we'll get right into it. Welcome. Good morning, members of the AP. Um, yes, we're here to talk about staff tasking. Um, there are two presentations as part of this. I'm going to give you an overview of the information in the memo, Diana Evans, Council of Staff. Um, and then Sarah Cleaver will come up and talk a little bit about specifically about the programmatic and engagement in the programmatic. So um, just to orient you to the action memo, I don't have a PowerPoint, um, but uh, I did just repost the action memo. If you had looked at it before, you might want to take a look. It's uh, I just added a couple of of uh, um, meetings, upcoming meetings, um, so that they're all listed in one place. But we have um, the normal overview, 
of committees and plan teams, upcoming meetings, section of the agenda. We have two upcoming meetings between now and June. The FMAC and the CRAB plan team are both um, going to be meeting in May, um, in the, I think it's the second week of May. Um, you already had a presentation from Katie Latanich uh, under administrative issues about the workshop that's planned for June for climate scenarios and noticing you of those three pre-meeting uh, virtual discussions, webinars that are going to take place beforehand that you might be interested in adding to your calendar. Um, just one other note, there is going to be, we were informed that the center is going to do a, a CIE, a Center of Independent Experts review of the Gulf Pollock Stock Assessment. So if that's something that's interested, interesting to you, it is open to the public in person at the Science Center in Seattle. The posted to the agenda, there is also a three documents that relate to committees, um, and this is at the result of uh, the request of the council from the last council meeting. So you always get the attachment that looks at committees, all the different committees that are on the council's books, so to speak, um, and their members. Uh, what we did uh, to augment that for this meeting was to add um, first that uh, we have a guidance doc document that identifies our policy on the structure of committees, um, the kind of elements that go into a terms of reference, um, that there must be a statement of purpose, that we must have a chair, those types of things when we report. Um, this is the, um, Shannon has pulled that up so that you can see what I'm referring to. I'm not planning to walk through that, but if that's something of interest to you, we just, this is, we've had this um, handout for several years now that we use when we start new committees and when we're talking with the chair and, and establishing the operational principles for each committee. Um, but uh, there are some mandatory and some discretionary elements to that with respect to how we take written versus oral public comment, um, how the agenda gets set, some of those different questions. So we just updated that because it was a little outdated with uh, our current intent to try uh, to the extent possible to have all of our committee meetings uh, occur with some kind of hybrid mode so that there's a remote access opportunity for people to follow those committees. Um, Shannon's just highlighted here that there are some definitions in that paper as well to distinguish what is a committee versus a plan team versus a, a work group, which is generally what we use to refer to kind of internal um, agency subgroups talking about a particular issue when we use that term. Um, and then the task force, which came out of the fishery ecosystem plans. So this is more just a, posted as a reference document for you. Not, I'm happy to answer questions about it if you have them, but this was, um, we thought it might be useful at the point that uh, just to share kind of how we think about committees, if that's relevant or interesting. The other document is the overview of committees, and that goes through each of the committees that's listed on the list that you normally see that highlights membership. And we just tried to pull together in one place um, what the purpose is of each of those committees, either from the terms of reference, if it, if it exists, or from the motion that initiated that committee um, from the council for our, our normal committees. We also have some executive committees like our executive committee, um, which deals with internal administrative issues for the council and is a composed of council members, um, our finance committee, things like that. So we just tried to put that in one place. I think our intention would be after this meeting to revise our website for committees so that um, that purpose can live on our website, just to be a little bit more transparent about what these committees are and what they do. And if they have a particular duration, if they're a standing committee or if they're uh, a trying to accomplish a particular task for the council. Um, at this meeting, I expect the council will go through this list. On the right-hand side, there are notes from staff. Um, and you can see on this uh, example that Shannon's showing here, the council coordination committee is something that we have listed on our books, but it's actually authorized now under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. We don't need to have that on our North Pacific council list anymore. So we're suggesting to the council that they remove it. Those are the types of changes you can see um, that I think the council will discuss. And if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them, but that was as much of an overview I was going to provide right now. Just trying to be more transparent and informative. Thank you. Any questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay. So just uh, before we get to uh, Sarah's presentation on the programmatic, which we'll do, I just wanted to highlight for you the normal activity for this staff tasking um, agenda item is to look at um, 
you know, looking ahead to meetings. Um, as you know, we'll be meeting in June in Kodiak after this meeting. And I'm going to turn to to Shannon to see if she wants to add anything. But um, if not, then certainly after this meeting, you'll get planning emails from her about, you know, normal planning for away meetings. Is there anything else you want to add, Shannon or Nicole? Um, thank you, Diana. Um, I would just like to highlight that an email will be forthcoming from me um, in order to get a sense of when you plan to arrive and depart in Kodiak. This is helpful to me and the hotel in order to free up space to members of the public. Um, there will be some flexibility, but if you do know when you plan to arrive um, and depart, that is very helpful. Secondly, um, and so that you have the timing and process, I would note that after I submit my preliminary rooming list for the advisory panel, um, uh, they will then enter your information into their system, and then another email will be forthcoming from me with instructions with how to actually reserve your room. And um, I would just ask that you do that in a timely manner, again, to free up space for the public and to make sure that you guys have a room in Kodiak. Thanks. Very important. And just noting about June, because we are having this workshop um, and Shannon's posted the preliminary schedule, obviously we'll, we'll finalize that after this meeting, after we get feedback from the council looking ahead to June. But uh, we do have the two-day climate workshop planned for Wednesday and Thursday, which means that the AP will start on Tuesday and then continue AP business on Friday when you're scheduled through Sunday. So it is going to be a longer meeting for AP members because we want, we are asking uh, or providing an opportunity for and encouraging you to participate in that that climate scenario workshop. Um, so um, if you are not intending, so we are asking you to register. You heard that from Katie on the first day. Um, if you're not intending to participate in that workshop, please um, clarify that with Shannon as well, because right now we're going to assume that all AP members will be participating in that, um, in that workshop. Um, I think those are the only things about June that I wanted to share. And then uh, just noting, uh, the, there is a re emergency action request uh, as part of the staff tasking materials to the council. Um, the council we posted for for the council's reference the guidelines concerning emergency action. So the council will consider that when they get to that agenda item. But um, those are the only things that I wanted to highlight. Obviously, if you have any questions on three meeting outlook or other things, we'd be happy to to field those. And otherwise, um, we'll have Sarah come and talk about programmatic. Susie. Thanks. Um, I saw on the couple back on the chart with all the different committees and some of the notes of what's ongoing. And I saw for the executive or for the enforcement committee in terms of reference, there's um, it noted that there's public interest in allowing public participation and testimony. Has there been any, I guess, discussions that could be characterized right now about that? Or is that kind of a wait and wait and get a report from the executive committee? or sorry, not executive enforcement. Through the chair, Susie. Um, yes, the that conversation came out of discussions around the workshop from last December, was it? A few meetings ago. Um, and it, we realized that in the terms of reference that exist for the enforcement committee, they do not allow uh, public comment, oral public comment during the meeting. And so I think that was an artifact of, you know, the committee structure, 15 years ago. Um, and so the leadership of that committee had indicated that that's something they want to change. What I would and expect might happen um, once the council discusses this committee list is that they suggest that particularly for any committee that hasn't revised their terms of reference within the last year, that, that either send that back to the committees to develop a terms of reference or to suggest changes. And so that's my end, what I would loosely anticipate that the council might do based on this information. I think it's a good opportunity for all the committees to take a look at what are your operating um, principles and are we still adhering to those? Do we need to update those at all? Any other questions? No other questions. Thank you. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the AP. Um, for the record, Sarah Kleber, Council staff. I'm just going to briefly talk about our kind of plans and opportunities for engagement, both public engagement and tribal engagement uh, for the programmatic evaluation. And so the, the council in February 
um, the council emphasized its intent to provide a robust and meaningful public and tribal engagement process uh, on the development of the programmatic evaluation, also known as the PEIS or programmatic EIS. Um, and in response to public testimony at that meeting, if you'll recall, the council extended, it kind of revised its timeline um, and extended that timeline for pre-scoping. And so council instructed staff to continue pre-scoping activities, um, engagement activities to kind of further involve um, the public tribes and other stakeholders uh, on the programmatic and, and mostly as it relates to trying to further develop um, the alternatives for the analysis of that action. Uh, as a reminder, that action is really, the programmatic evaluation is really looking at the council's management policies, goals and objectives for uh, all of the federally managed fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska, Bering Sea, and Aleutian Islands. And in February, the, the council supported NIMPS tribal consultation to continue to, continue to receive um, input on this. Um, and then that would be occurring as part of the, the pre-scoping process. And then formal NEPA scoping actually uh, as you might remember, it begins when the notice of intent to prepare, uh, to prepare an EIS um, is published by NIMPS. So that, that formal scoping process doesn't begin until that date. Um, currently under the, the council's timeline, which they, I guess it's on the previous slide, in February, the, the council's revised timeline included issuing the notice of intent in fall of 2024. So that pushed that, um, that delayed that a little bit later than was, uh, than the council had before been looking at before the February meeting. And so any of the public scoping comments that would come out of um, formal NEPA scoping would then follow that, um, that NEPA scoping period. So if the if NIMPS prepared a notice of intent in the fall, um, then we would expect the council to be to be able to receive um, a report of all of those public scoping comments um, at a at a meeting likely in the winter spring um, of 2025. So since February, staff, both council staff and NIMPS staff, have been looking at um, what our options for engagement are given the council's February motion and tried to consider both how the council wants a robust and meaningful engagement process, um, but also given that fall 2024 timeline. Um, so currently on the slide here, which I'm gonna refer to as timeline A, is what staff have planned given some of those, um, some of those considerations. So currently NIMS has a tribal engagement meeting planned on April 17th. And then they are working to try to set up another additional tribal engagement meeting um, in late April or early May. And if there are specific questions on, on the details of that, um, I think they were going to be in the room for this, but I don't see them here. Um, my name's counterparts, so I would have to get back to you on any kind of updates on planning for that one. But as far as I know, that's still in the works. They're still trying to um, get that scheduled. We heard in February uh, loud and clear that trying to do tribal engagement over the summer is not a good time for um, because tribes are, are engaging in subsistence activities. So we really tried to avoid scheduling uh, any tribal engagement activities um, between late May and August um, or September. However, if the council wants the... Um, if the council would like the NOI, the notice of intent to go out in fall of 2024, we took that to mean the, after the October 2024 meeting, that means that NIMPS would notify tribes of consultation for the October meeting in August so that there would be time for tribal consultation to occur in September. Um, that timeline would then put us at the October council meeting where the council would receive that report um, from any pre-scoping activities, tribal consultation, uh, receive also the work workshop report from the June climate scenario planning workshop uh, as it relates to any of the um, 
any of the develop the development of any of the programmatic alternatives. And then we also would plan to bring kind of a, a staff straw man of management goals and objectives um, at that October meeting for the AP and council to look at and um, provide recommendations on just as a starting point so that uh, you all in the council would have something in front of you to, um, to kind of get us to a place where the alternatives are a little bit more defined. After that, we would have the formal NEPA scoping period, which could either be 45 or 90 days. Um, and then that would put us on a timeline for next April to be reviewing those, those comments that come out of the formal NEPA scoping process. And the council could then further refine those alternatives. Um, we, in, in our staff discussions, we recognized that the, the council had discussed some further pre-scoping activities, but we weren't sure exactly what the council intent or, or details of additional pre-scoping activities would be. So we wanted to bring this back at this meeting to make sure that um, if this, whether this plan fulfills the council's intent for engagement, or if the council uh, wanted to add any further engagement opportunities. And so that's where this kind of more delayed timeline, timeline B that's on the slide now would come in because if the council wanted to include further opportunities for engagement, uh, we imagine that those would need to occur not during the summer, as we've heard, would not not work, but that would need to happen this fall. And so if there are additional pre-scoping activities that the council wants to happen, um, we would be looking more towards this timeline um, where the where the National Marine Fishery Service would notify tribes of um, opportunity for tribal consultation prior to the December meeting. Uh, and then at that meeting, instead of the October meeting, the council would review that feedback. The NOI would be published after the, de the December meeting. And then NEPA scoping would occur early in 2025. But then the, the um, earliest that the council would then be able to review those NEPA scoping comments and then revise their alternatives would be in June. And I'll note that um, there are some trade-offs here because the June meeting is in Newport, Oregon. It's not uh, not in Alaska. So I just wanted everyone to be aware of that. Um, what we're really looking for from the council, which the advisory panel, we ob obviously welcome you to provide input to the council on this at this meeting, is um, what types of pre-scoping activities, if we haven't hit them correctly here, what types of pre-scoping activities the council wants. So if they want any further um, engagement opportunities, and then we can kind of look at which one of these timelines um, will work best for that to occur. Um, another option is that some of these engagement opportunities could be pushed to be to be um, done or to be executed during the NEPA scoping uh, process. So instead of, you know, it, for engagement opportunities, um, it doesn't necessarily matter whether they are part of pre-scoping or scoping. What really matters is that they are timed for what types of input the council wants from those that are engaging on scoping. So if the council, as it said before, really wants input on the development of what the alternative should be prior to the notice of intent going out, then it would be important to get engagement um, early on in the process. But if the council is okay with putting out alternatives in the notice of intent um, and then getting a lot of feedback on that, then we could con we could do engagement opportunities, um, engagement activities as part of the formal NEPA scoping process. So um, it engagement can happen at any of those times. And we're hoping that the other thing the council can provide feedback on now would be what it intends for um, engagement opportunities during that NEPA scoping process as well. Um, so a little bit more, more feedback on what types of activities and when um, the council would like those to occur. 
Um, there's a very short discussion paper attached that has kind of the details on this on, on your um, staff tasking section of the e-agenda. And um, I skipped this slide, but this is what I just said about what types of information we're looking for from the APR Council. Um, and I'll open up it up to some questions. I know it's probably kind of hard to process the timelines at this point in your meeting. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I have a question. So you, you may have mentioned this and I'm like, a lot of this is going over my head at this point, um, which might give some credence to what I'm about to say. It looks like uh, our, our options right now for refining alternatives for analysis for the programmatic, which is, as we know, is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty big deal, uh, are either in June in Newport or in April when we're expecting to have final action on chum salmon. I'm concerned about both of those options, and I'm wondering if there's, are there are there any other options? Because I, like I said, if we do it when, when we have the same time as final action on chum salmon, we can expect a lot of public engagement on both of those, which would be great, but I'm thinking about capacity for uh, a meeting itself, how long a meeting can run, and also just capacity for, for AP members and council members to, to really have robust discussions. Um, you know, I hate to admit it, but I, I do think that people have limits on, on how much they can think in a week. Um, and these are, these are both, uh, really important emotional issues. And that that's just a concern for me. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. And I, I really hope that we would all admit that we have limits, um, here because I know mine are pretty low and I'm always amazed that you guys can get through all the issues that you do in a meeting. Um, so the short answer to your question is there is certainly opportunity to alter this timeline. Um, the council's timelines are always, always changing. So first, the only thing that really locks us a bit more into a faster track timeline is once we publish the notice of intent, which is why in February the council chose to delay doing that so that they could kind of get, um, we all could get our feet kind of under what this issue exactly is and how we're going to approach it and what kinds of feedback we're looking for. Um, and so the council chose to delay that till the fall. If the AP and council want to further delay the publishing of the notice of intent, then that further delays this, this issue to kind of be, um, be further down the road. I will say that once the notice of intent is published, um, we are kind of trying our best to make sure that because of the new NEPA guidance that we got, um, that we stick to the timeline that is required under that. And I can't remember exactly. I think we have two two years for an EIS. Um, but prior to that NOI going out, the timelines can change. The other consideration is the IRA funding that the council um is using for these climate related activities. We need to do our best to try to be showing some progress towards um, towards the goals that were set out when the council applied for IRA funding for climate activities. And I'm not sure, um, Diana's sitting behind me and might know exactly how, how much we need to be st considering that and sticking to our timeline. Um, so I'm gonna let her answer that because I'm not sure of that. I just note that the, we haven't actually heard from National Fisheries Service that they have supported our IRA funding application. So that's um, obviously still to be determined. But we did try to identify that because we think the programmatic will really help us with looking and evaluating our climate readiness as a council and looking ahead kind of a policy. How do we want to be um managing in adaptively in a world of increased environmental variability um, that we have dedicated, if we receive those funds, a portion of those are dedicated to support the analytical work and the analytical burden that's associated with doing this programmatic. So 
we would like to do it within that time frame, which is basically completing the work between now and 2027, or at least the work that we would need to have funded um, through the additional uh, funding that we expect to, that we hope to receive through IRA. So I, I don't think that it is I both that and the, the, the new guidelines with respect to completing an EIS, um, they're not so constraining to the to the council um, that we can't make sure that we are engaging in the appropriate process. So we don't want the we don't want to be in a situation where we think we're doing a bad process because we're dictating things by timelines, but we want to try to be um, make sure that we are keeping with the intent, which is we know we have this this analysis that we are that the council is interested in doing, um, and we want to do it in this format, and so we should be trying to do that in an expeditious manner so it doesn't last you know drag on forever. So it's a little bit of um, I mean, these are all the the things that we're considering around the edges. I think the the most important thing that it would be helpful for the advisory panel to talk about is what do you think is the right activities that we should be doing to make sure we're doing this job well? And then we can figure out some of the constraints about timeline once you give us that input. Thank you. Uh, we have a question online from Melissa, and then we'll go to Eva. Melissa, go ahead. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chair, thank you, staff, for your presentation. I just had a question in regards to, um, you know, the agenda scheduling, and I apologize for um, not asking, like, at the beginning, but um, is there a reason why this agenda item was placed under staff tasking and not, um, you know, as another, like, a a major agenda item, considering that uh, we did not get to this opportunity, um, you know, a couple of times, uh, just, you know, concerns for uh, the tribal sector, you know, that uh, this is a very important um, agenda item. It, and it's, uh, you know, important to other sectors as well. But, you know, as far as um, helping to to keep members of the public um, who are following this item, um, like having it stand out more than under staff tasking. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, Melissa. Yes, I, I hear your your comments, and I, certainly with respect to review of this agenda item at the advisory panel, unfortunately, due to other time and constraints and other priorities, um, we haven't had a chance to present that information to you in recent meetings. In February, when this uh, came up at the, was scheduled on the agenda as an agenda item, uh, Sarah was able to present to the council. And I know there was a lot of public testimony or there was public testimony because it really dictated the council's de decision to go a different direction with respect to releasing the scoping notice um, at Prior to when we walked into the February council meeting, we were really thinking we were trying to respond to previous testimony that we received that this is urgent and we should move fast. And when we what we heard from public testimony in February was that maybe we need to just pause and take a moment and kind of rethink through this pre-scoping or utilize this pre-scoping opportunity before we get to the formal NEPA notice of intent and make sure that we're getting the right input in the development of alternatives. And so I I do think that um, I I absolutely acknowledge that it was unfortunate the advisory panel didn't have a chance to weigh in on that issue. Um, but I do think there was at least a good conversation about that at the council, including with the pub with members of the public. Um, for this meeting, the we are really using this as an opportunity to confirm with the council what its interest is in terms of the activities that constitute pre-scoping versus scoping, formal scoping, what activities that the council want to host. Um, I, Sarah's put together this uh, plan for you about the potential, the, the actions that we've scheduled to date. Um, and so we're really trying to, to ensure, do we are there other activities that the council wants to commit to and during which time frame? Is it during the pre-scoping time frame or the formal scoping time frame um, that you want that, or the council is interested in having that happen? Um, that seemed to us something that naturally fits within the type of issues that we bring back at staff tasking to confirm with the council. Um, the you know, are we 
ca correctly capturing the intent and are we looking at this in terms of the timeframes and the milestones appropriately? Um, we did try to highlight on the E agenda under staff tasking that there was a programmatic engagement update during this agenda item, um, but that was really the reason for scheduling it. It certainly wasn't intended to disenfranchise anybody. It's just the action for the council. This could be inform informational for the council if the council is comfortable with the degree uh, or the, the activities that have been planned to date, or the council could direct us to do other actions, and we'd be happy to obviously um, pursue or schedule or um, you know respond to the council however is appropriate. But that was our logic um, for putting that under 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 the E agenda item. It wasn't intending to bury this or to provide a less public focus and. Um, if that was the outcome that was unintended, we can certainly address that going forward. Thank you, Diana. Eva. Uh, thank you, through the chair. I really think it's important to get this one right and to think that you can do a lot within pre-scoping. And I, um, just so you know how we're we're trying to get ready for the climate change workshop is... Um, Tribes have are trying to do their best to advocate within the system, and that that means finding the resources and structure to basically mimic uh, resource management. And so, um, I'm working. I I was just recently hired for the Fish Commission and work closely with TCC to find that team of experts that are familiar with climate change uh, planning, people that work with many of the tribes um, on like relocation plans, looking at all the different funding, and then also thinking, what does climate-ready fisheries look like? And also, from my perspective, um, really wanting to analyze some of the science that is going into this and what things are uh, looking like. I put a lot of stuff on the record yesterday about my concerns with some of the science that's been done, the, the data that could have been collected but has not been collected. Um, and so, Again, I want to put on the record because I just had to step out to go support the tribes as they were testifying to the council. The tribes that represent the 118 communities in the Arctic, Yukon, Kuskokwim region. And, you know, it's people, this is not their first English is not their first language, let alone this stuff. And so I even even thought about how I haven't even got to learn my own language because I'm so busy trying to learn this language. And this because of this, we need to have a, a different process for pre-scoping that needs to, to not look like what we've seen. So for example, in the tribal engagements, and I'm sorry for this long answer question, but it, it's really important. In the tribal enga engagement consultations that we're in and even in all of these fisheries, federal management processes, all this information is presented to us. And often engagement is like, hey, let us present all this stuff to you. And then, and then we're supposed to have some type of discussion. But really, I think it needs to look a little bit different than that. And so um, in trying to sum up what I'm thinking is that it's a little bit hard to plan that in this space, but if we could get together and start to flush out some good ideas. And so I think we're gonna bring a team down to Kodiak for the climate change workshop. And I think that we'll have a lot of experts there that we can start to imagine what this looks like and what the activities we wanna do because we're doing it by Zoom and I'm, I'm happy for the workshop so we can actually have a chance to do things in person. And we need more of that. We need you guys to come up to where we're at um, and engage with us that way. Come come, come to the fish camp where I'm flying in frozen sockeye to teach the kids who don't even have sockeye in the river. Come to that camp and, and spend a little time with us. And, and we can also work on um, stuff. We have PowerPoints right on the riverbank. But I wanted to put a couple things on the record that were also put on the record last time that the tribes feel there's, and this is coming directly from the tribes I've mentioned uh, for the AYK. Uh, there should be a, and before I get into this, this this whole thing initiated because of stuff from allies that we work with that hadn't communicated with us on our capacity to take something like this on. So there's been a lot of pushback from the tribes out. Yeah, we do need to do this, but we need to do it right. So let's not rush. 
And that's one thing that I've seen in this entire process is everybody's trying to digest so much freaking information that we're literally rushing. And I, and from my perspective as an indigenous person who has, you know, we've been passing down to knowledge for 11,000 years about Alaska and people come up here and start collecting data in a, size, a state this size and pretend like they're experts. It's really offensive. So we really, um, would like to see better with that. <laughs> um, you know, so we want a hard pause in order to reset things regarding the PEIS onto a proper footing. And the filing of the notice of intent should be held off until such footing is achieved. The PEIS process now is not clear with widespread confusion that it is not improving. It isn't aligned with the proper consideration of tribes and where things are now is largely divorced from prior work on this. This is not a good place from which to proceed, especially for something that will have a countdown associated with it that will create significant constraints once a notice of intent is issued. This process must be deliberative, well-planned, and constitute progress. This work should build upon successes of the past and move federal fishery management forward. We need a deliberative and productive pause to help ensure such an approach can be achieved. Work moving forward needs to understand what achievements have been made and how they should be maintained. Additionally, it is necessary at the outset to develop an understanding of what has not worked and why that is the case. For example, why did various significant elements of the existing ground fish fisheries management plan have insufficient progress? There are significant issues which should have had been included at a baseline for moving forward, but are currently not. For example, a reasonable range of alternatives and comprehensive goals and objectives, consideration of a precautionary approach to management, a robust engagement and consultation strategy for working with tribal entities, and a commitment to tribal co-management and co-stewardship. So um, I'm sorry for these long comments. So thank you for listening. And I appreciate Brian asking your question because it was going to be my next question. Um, and it's really important to consider that we are building our, our crew and we're going to have be eyeballs deep into the chum salmon um, and getting ready for October. And so we're going to do our best to, to take this June stuff on, but there's going to be, as you can imagine, that's it, the timeline could shift. It could be paused. And it sounds like from your funding, it, maybe it should be. And I'm very exhausted to figure out what that timing is right now, but I, I don't think <laughs> what we have in front of us is, is actually going to work to have solid engagement with us in a, in a productive way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Rick. Um, through the Jared, thank you. Um, I'm getting a little bit lost. So April 17th, what's happening? Is that this April 17th? What's happening on this April 17th? We don't know yet or where it's going to be. Through the chair, thanks for the question. So on April 17th, um, NIMPS is conducting a tribal engagement session. I believe that that one, um, I can't remember if that is with TCC or not, um, but NIMPS is organizing that. And that, as far as I understand it, that will be an opportunity for tribes to ask questions, identify um, anything that they want us to try to clarify about the process so far um, or things that we should consider moving forward. I've never personally participated in a tribal consultation or a tribal engagement meeting. Um, sorry, it's not consultation yet. This would just be a, um, a tribal engagement meeting. Um, so I don't know exactly, but I do plan to provide a kind of brief, my role in it is I'll be providing a brief um, presentation, very similar to what the council received in February on kind of what we know about the council programmatic process so far, and then um, be available for any questions that come out of that. Um, and then, and then I believe NIMPS will also be providing some um, more information on the NEPA process as um, if that is something that tribes would like to come out of that. Um, so that's open. I wish there was a NIMPS counterpart here to answer any more questions on that meeting, um, but th that's currently the only one scheduled so far. Thank you for that answer. And who is it open to? I mean, is it open to the public? What did or no, it's just a private meeting. 
uh, as I understand it, it's uh, it's only open to tribes. Uh, Ava, you might, Ava, you might be able to provide a little bit more information than we can. But we can also get, um, I believe, someone from National Marine Fisheries Service, if you want to just circle back to ask questions about that after uh, public testimony, we can we can see if someone will come over and talk about that more. But Yes, thank you, through the chair. Yes, we tried to keep the engagement to our tribal invited tribal representatives only. Um, just we do have structure as far as like chiefs, um, fish commissioners, technical experts, consultants. So we do try to have a planned team in the room in our engagement. And from my understanding, well, let me rephrase that for the consultation. Now, the engagement might have... Um, opportunity for other people to be there. I'm not quite sure about that part. I'd have to double check. Okay, thank you both for your answer. I just thought maybe that would be an opportunity for some more pre-scoping, you know, to happen more people. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Uh, with that, we only have one person signed up for public testimony. I'd like to move to public testimony and then see if we have any motions. Uh, just try to get through all of this before lunch. Um, we have Kirill Basarjan signed up for public testimony. Mr. Basarjan, are you with us? I, I guess I am. Good morning. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we've got you loud and clear. Go ahead. One second. Um, apologize. So I have two proposals there. I'm submitting again I, that I submitted in uh, December and the January meeting, <clears throat> proposing the uh, long line slinky pot. We're asking for support from the AP to move this forward. Um, I spoke to uh, the National Pacific, <clears throat> North Pacific uh, Association also, uh, Pacific Association, and we're going to be working on the uh, proposal a little bit more in depth in, in the, in, so for the June meeting. But at this time, we're asking if the AP can look over it again and see if they, someone from the AP can support so we can move forward with the uh, proposal for the stinky pot federal yeah, issue. Also, I have a proposal for the 4A vessel length restriction. I believe the IFQ committee has brought that up um, here at the IFQ committee, and I'm hoping that uh, the AP can also um, support this uh, proposal going forward. We're trying to push it at least for the next year. It's very hard for fishermen to find vessels to fish in the 4A areas, the B class. We're proposing to make the uh, vessel amendment like they have in the uh, 3B, 2C, 4D, and E area. And I'm hoping that can uh, clarify things. If, if anybody has questions, I'm open. Thank you, Carol. Does uh does the AP have any questions? Um, I guess I have one, Carol. I've uh, seen some of this stuff before. I'm just I think maybe I've asked you this before. Actually, um, are you open to hey. communicating with an AP member, maybe, so that we can get a a, a motion put together? Um, it would just be a lot easier to get a motion together if we could work on it beforehand. Um. I'm in town there if you if you want to talk sometime. Yes, that'll that that would help um, greatly for us if someone can step in and help us with that. That would be greatly appreciated. All right, thanks, Carol. Uh, yeah, we'll try to link up once I get back to town. Um, okay, sounds good. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Carol, I'm not seeing any. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I'll see you soon. Okay. Appreciate it. Good evening. Thank you for all your time. Thank you. Um, that concludes public testimony. Uh, with that, do we have any staff tasking motions? Susie? 
All right. Since there's no other staff tasking motions, I move to approve the February 2024 AP minutes. Thanks. And I move to adjourn the April 2024 meeting. All right. Thank you, everyone. That will conclude our April 2024 meeting. Thanks to staff uh, for all the hard work and members of the public for engagement. Thanks to the AP for working so hard on all this. Good work. Oh, wait, we've got Emily here to help us with uh, that NIMS question that we had. Oh, please, please fill us in. Yeah, it would be helpful. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, so it's through the chair. It's my understanding there was a question that came about with the tribal engagement sessions. Are they associated with the programmatic EIS or the CHUM bycatch? I guess that's my clarifying question first. EIS. Okay, so the programmatic EIS, uh, NIMS and our council staff are getting together and creating a first of a series of tribal engagements. So the first one will be held on April 17th from 10 to 11. We'll be sharing some initial information with our tribal partners during that time about the programmatic EIS planning. Um, we don't have all information that's needed in order to um, fully paint a picture, it's it's in the works, but that'll be the first of the discussions. So that meeting's held with our Alaska Native Tribes, corporations, and tribal serving organizations. How about the, so, the back to the mic, you guys open looking there? So we will be inviting all our tribal partners under our trust responsibility with NIMPS to have a conversation and a dialogue with us. So we're inviting them to the table. If you are an Alaska Native tribal member, um, a member of a corporation or a tribal serving organization that represents your tribe, you're welcome to come and attend that session with us. It's a chance for you to come, voice your concerns, share and have, participate in a discussion as we move forward. We'll be gathering that feedback and then incorporating that into our planning process. So um, the next available date. We've heard from the Tanana Chiefs Conference that April 17th doesn't work. And I'm looking at Eva, she's nodding. So we are working on a May 6th date. We haven't firmed that up. It's not official. So um, please stay tuned for the next announcement from NIMPS on the tribal engagement um, planning sessions. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? All right, now it's over. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, don't forget to send in your your rationale and to uh, oh, yeah, and to approve. Thanks.